Good evening. Welcome to the April 28th, 2015 school board meeting. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Announcements and executive session report. Uh, the public is hereby advised of the audio and video recording of this meeting for the purposes of rebroadcasting. I'd also like to announce that there was an executive session of the full board held on April 20th, 2015 for matters of personnel. And there was an executive session of the HR committee of the board held on April 21st, 2015 for matters of personnel. By way of attendance, all board members are present this evening except Mrs. Shackleford who is out of the country. And so we'll move on to recognition of guests and scheduled speakers. Dr. Zerby. Thank you, Mr. President. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, from first student, our transportation contractor, uh, Mr. Charlie Huffman and Mr. Randy Williams, for a check presentation in the amount of $5,000 towards the Warrior Pride campaign. Mr. Williams, Mr. Huffman, please come forward. Absolutely, the Bank of Williams. <laughs> On behalf of the um, Thackton School District, uh, we, we appreciate your donation and we'll put the, uh, the funds along with the other $1.3 million that we've raised to this point in time uh, to good use. So thank you so much. Uh, next on the, uh, on the agenda, item 5.2, the M Awards presentation. Uh, intermediate School Principal, Ms. Page. Before we recognize our students, I want to um, ask our advisor and co-advisors for our science fair team to come forward. And I want to introduce them and formally recognize all of their hard work and efforts. Mrs. Kathy Stewart is our advisor for our science fair. The behind the scenes work that it takes in order to get the judges to prepare the students, to help them with their public speaking, to put together their presentation, it just takes a monumental effort, and Mrs. Stewart can coordinates all this. Mrs. McGinnis and Mrs. Green, two of our science teachers, assist Mrs. Stewart with the work with the students. So if you would please come forward so we can present the Epple Awards. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to give that to Yeah. All right. Back in November, the journey started for these students with the Arcola Science Fair team. The top 23 scorers became our team after the Arcola Science Fair. One of the five area competitions that the team participates in is the Montgomery County Science Research Competition. We call it MCSRC. On March 10th of this year, Ursinus College hosted 330 middle school students and over 580 high school students from over 28 public and private schools. The MCSRC requires a tri-fold display board, a logbook, and a research report. The projects are divided into grade level and then subject matter. 
uh, and the actual competition day, the students have to defend their project, give a brief explanation of their protocol, and then answer any question that the judges pose to them. Along with the individual awards, the schools are awarded placement based on accumulation of highest number of points in the current competition year. Our COLA Intermediate School has placed in the top three for seven out of the last eight years. I got to stop. Okay. Okay. Thanks. This is the third consecutive year that our COLA Science Fair team has been awarded the first place plaque, and it will be presented to us because they retire the plaque after you win it three years in a row, and that I'm proud of. <laughs> so, I really have to thank Mrs. Page for all her support too, and I couldn't do this without my two assistants, Mrs. McGinnis and Mrs. Green, but I have to tell you, all my thanks go to the hard work that was put in by the 23 school members, and I can't do it without you guys. All right, congrats. Here we go. Okay, I'll be calling your name when you come on up, when you hear your name. And uh, Mrs. Page is going to shake you, your hand and get you, give you your certificate. <coughs> Lou, you want me to hand these to you? Let me hand them yeah, to you. Yeah, okay. Ashmita Sivakumar. Claire Say. Brian Lee. Davron Borhan. <laughs> Ashley Upani. Arushi Tiwari. Shreya Patel. Sonia Patel. <laughs> Ryan McShane. <laughs> Julia Jablonski. Aaron Hardenberg. Socket Gohale. Garrett Campbell. Adam Zhang. And David Palco. Do we have Yes. Have we got it? Oh, I don't. Oh, did Neha? Oh, she must have left. Neha Vagvala. Congratulations. Thank you. Just the time. Wonderful. Good job, Just one more word as the parents are taking the photo off. As Mrs. Stewart read what all these students needed to go through, sounds like a doctoral program and a dissertation. <laughs> Good job, everyone.
The, uh, the next item on the agenda is item 5.3, the extended school year, the ESY program. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Angstad to come forward. And I also ask uh, that the board please take uh, their seats uh, in the audience in the first row. Thank you. Everyone, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce you to our um, special education supervisors, Dr. Deanie Ryan, Ms. Danny Faustin, and Mr. Tim Merch, and they're going to give a brief presentation on extended school year services. Hi. Hi. I'm Tim Merch, uh, the special ed supervisor for the elementary grades K through 4. Um, tonight we'd like to give you a brief overview of what is extended school year or what we typically refer to as ESY. Um, I thought we'd start off with what is ESY? It's uh, special education and related services that are provided to students with disabilities beyond the 180 day school year. Uh, in order to determine ESY, we, we follow IDEA and Chapter 14 <coughs> guidelines when de determining ESY. That's the Individuals with Dis Disabilities Education Act and the federal and state special education laws. Um, they all state that school districts must provide ESY services if a student needs these services to receive a free and appropriate public education or, or FAPE. That means any student with an IEP can and, and will be considered for ES, ESY. So why ESY? Interruptions in instruction may result in children with disabilities losing their basic skills and taking a longer time for them to regain those skills once school is back in session. So ESY services are provided during breaks in educational program to prevent this loss. So the next question then is how do we determine eligibility for ESY? And that is done through the IEP team process based on current IEP measurable annual goals for students. We collect the data through progress monitoring and we look at that to see whether or not there's been progress made throughout the school year. In and breaks throughout the school year as well. We have to look at ESY eligibility for each student with an IEP each and every year. So it's done independently. So ESY eligibility for summer 2015 is not dependent on whether or not it was received in 2014 and does not predetermine eligibility for 2016. So there are seven factors of eligibility when we look at students in regards to making that determination. Regression, recoupment, regression, recoupment, mastery, self-sufficiency and independence, success of interruptions and severity of disability. I'm going to just explain the first three up here and Ms. Faustin will take the last four. So regression is, has there been a decrease in skills or behaviors based on an interruption in the school year? 
if that has happened, then eligibility for ESY can be um, discussed among the team. Recoupment, is the student able to recoup those skills that students may lose over breaks at a normal rate as their typical peers? So those two things separately and then as a, as a pair um, are the first three factors of eligibility. The other four factors are mastery. So we want to look at whether or not a student has mastered a specific skill and then whether a break in their educational programming would cause that student to lose that skill. Then our next eligibility or factor, I'm sorry, is self-sufficiency and independence. We want students to gain independence so they can be um, free from their caretakers. So these are Establish goals that students are working towards per their IEP. Successive interruptions, um, just that extended breaks during the school year may cause students to lose or um, disrupt their learning progress. And then depending on the severity of the disability, um, it may cause students to need this extended school year. And then how is, this, how is determination? Um, the steps are the IEP team will gather data um, and then participation in ESY is driven by the IEP team and the data that's gathered by the team. Um, once the data is gathered, the team determines whether the student will participate in ESY and then once the team determines that the student will participate in ESY, the team will issue the NORAP, which is the Notice of Recommended Educational Placement. Thank you. <laughs> Although there might be questions from the board for this group, um, there is a second presentation that we want that I want to bring forward here this evening as part of my report, so that we don't need to go back up and down on the on seats. So what we'll do is I'll, sp I'll spend about five minutes giving the board and the public an update on the field construction project. Then we'll go back to our seats, and then we can ask questions on both the ESY program and the field construction project. Okay. So construction has begun. If um, you've been on the uh, high school campus any time in the last month or so, you've noticed that construction began by taking over what used to be known as the outdoor basketball courts. Um, it's, uh, it runs uh, right next to the tennis courts. We've staged this area to place all of the supplies for the construction. So as you notice, um, we started back nearly uh, over a month ago with construction in creating this roadway so that we could get supplies to and from this gated area. In addition to that, um, some of the initial steps that began was uh, placing construction fencing, uh, which eventually would there be caps on top of there. This is probably the day that they started the, the placement of the construction. And also over to the right, we have a picture of the silt uh, sock, which is used to help uh, control the, any erosion or water runoff or, or soil runoff that, that may occur as a result of uh, digging and then uh, having weather such as rain. If we take a look at this project and what we have, uh, the work we have before us, we know that, and, and just to give you a reference point, this is the high, high school stadium field. Over here is a bus garage and bus compound. And over here is where the uh, auxiliary field or uh, other uh, synthetic turf field will be constructed. And then the two softball fields, both the JV softball field and the varsity softball field. Over in this area, the next couple photos that I want to share with you are really located in this area here, which is called the Large Stormwater Basin. And then there's actually two areas here and here along the uh, third baseline of the JV baseball field, which is located here, and the first baseline of the JV baseball field, where excess soil will be deposited. And lastly, um, there's, a, there's an area along the back of the visitor's 
uh, bleachers all along the length of the stadium field were additional soil as they dig out the area here for the basin. Just to give you an idea of what we're doing at this point in time. So let's take a look at some of those photos. Uh, this is probably within maybe day two or three uh, or so. Um, where we see that you know construction has, uh, has begun uh, moving the topsoil and placing this topsoil in different uh, parts of the property so that then the the undersoil can be moved and, and, and rock can be covered and the topsoil then can be used later uh, for when the uh, when we're near the conclusion of construction or to a stage of construction where we need to have topsoil back onto the property instead of having uh, us you know transport additional soil in Here's an example of the stormwater basin with uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the concrete construction uh, units uh, that will help uh, catch water and divert water through the piping. Um, here is another uh, probably a week later dig or view of, of the dig of the stormwater basin. And this is probably a, uh, a, a view of within the last day or so of the uh, stormwater basin. So you can see that significant construction has occurred. We have a, a lot of topsoil and a lot of uh, soil being moved across the, the property. So if we take a look back at this, at this area again, you'll notice that uh, I said before, a lot of the soil is going to be deposited along here and at the end of the day we'll be burying rock and then covering that up with with uh, with, with dirt and then topsoil and this will extend the, uh, the the surface area beyond where it currently e exists at the end of the day and same with this area and this area here so let's take a look at those areas right now you can see this is where some of these the soil and some of the rock that's being excavated uh, out by the uh, the heavy equipment and placed here. Um, here's another example of the photo uh, where well, they'll, be, they'll be eventually leveling this off for, uh, for, for use. And here is the, the last photo. This is, this is, the, this is Mill Road. Whoops, whoops. This is Mill Road. And this is the JV baseball field right here. And this is also the lower construction entrance for construction vehicles. Some of the other work that's uh, been, been primarily completed indoors is the electrical work. So the electrical contractor has been in working third shifts, being supervised as part of that process by district employees, and uh, they have constructed the uh, conduit uh, necessary to run the uh, cables for the electrical work. You'll see a photograph of the gymnasium here. Um, you'll notice that conduit runs up along the, the ceiling of the gymnasium. When school is out, the uh, contractor will come back in and they'll be painting those conduits so that they match the ceiling so they're less obvious. And in summary, I just want to go through some of these points here. Um, the status of the field lighting. I just want to let the board know and the public know that currently uh, the field lighting is really still in the PA Com a Court of Common Pleas. Um, as, as you are aware, uh, we appealed the decision of Worcester Township and we are asking that uh, the, the Court of Common Pleas agree with us uh, primarily uh, with the uh, illumination levels necessary for safe play. We're hopeful, however, that the decision on this matter will come as soon as possible and will certainly come in the right period of time that will fit into our construction. But we are prepared, regardless of when that decision is made, and uh, to either take uh, the, the, the lighting on or to defer the lighting to a later date when construction can reasonably uh, be uh, concluded. With the timeline, I want to basically let everybody know that we're approximately about four weeks behind schedule. Uh, a lot of that was due to the, uh, to the weather and other mobilization uh, needs. Uh, but we're working with the contractor to find ways that we can expedite some of the, the matters. Uh, Worcester Township has been helpful in, uh, in cooperating with us to, to find ways to do that. And we hope that together we'll be able to, uh, you know, 
increase the, our ability to meet the scheduled timeline of a mid-August uh, substantial completion date. The cost, currently, uh, cost-wise, we're at uh, $5,263,000. Uh, 263, uh, that's, that's where we're at with, with the cost, inclusive of all change orders at this point in time. Um, we, we know that um, we've, we've raised, uh, with the check that we received this evening, um, we've raised pledges in the amount of a little over $1.4 million. And uh, we're, we're happy to say that uh, we're still working with the uh, fundraising committees in order to not only raise money online but raise money through other uh, planned activities and events that are currently under the under the way to be planned and next steps uh, next steps are really to finalize a recovery schedule to get back some of the time that we lost due to weather in those four weeks and we're hopeful to be able to report back at next month meeting to let you know that uh, and that we're able to do that and that we're able to uh, uh, meet that timeline, or if not, um, what things we need to deal with as an organization to get us on track uh, as close as possible. So that there ends my uh, report on the field the construction project. Um, I'd ask the board uh, to please be so kind to take their seats back at the, uh, at the table, and we'll open the floor up for questions on ESY or the field construction project. Okay, we'll start with uh, the ESY presentation. Um, I had a question. The, um, so the determination for, uh, for participation in ESY is uh, based on the IEP and, and the evaluation. Um, I'm just curious, is there any, ever an instance where a parent disagrees or, or doesn't want the student to participate over the summer or are they typically, you know, to follow the recommendation of the uh, the team. Well, we definitely have most of our students. It's a joint decision, and everybody is on board with the decision for the ESY component for the student. However, there are parents who basically reject that offer. The ESY um, eligibility is really an offer from the school district. Um, so, if the parent chooses not to do it, we have several. We have one student who goes out of t uh, out of state to to, vi to visit family for the summer, so they reject our offer for ESY. The most important part for the school district's piece is to make an offer based on the, the need. If parents accept it, that's great. We provide it. it there's, sometimes there's conversations about what program may make sense for a particular student. So I know the three of us generally are doing uh, some research if parents come with a different program. So we, but it's generally a, uh, an agreed upon situation. And so in that case, um, if the student was out of state visiting family for the summer, would, would that student be able to get those types of programs from a, from a, a different district, or there's no, no reciprocity? Okay. No, no, it would just be from our dis district, and we would offer a particular program. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Woodrick? Yeah, I was just wondering if um, when you were going through the protocols and the seven factors, those things, is that a Methacton model, or is that a requirement under education code or something? What you there. saw tonight, there is what we call a TDR, which is a teacher desk reference, and there's also an, uh, uh, a larger uh, put out by uh, PDE. Uh, you can get these from Patan, um, but all that information that you saw tonight is through IDEA and Chapter 14 regulations that we're ob obliged to, to adhere to. Mm -hmm. Mr. McFarland? Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, just in a macro sense, to get some idea. How many students are presently involved in the ESY, and of that, how many are K to four, just approximately? I'm going to take a guess. I think there's about 200 K to four students with IEPs. I I don't know the exact numbers. Um, Tim would have to yeah. do that. Um, I can speak for secondary at the high school. There's approximately 255 IEPs, and of those, we have about 40 students, 43 students who are eligible for ESY services. Okay, thank you. On the K through four level, we have about two, 200 students with IEPs, and uh, going through my records, we're offering ESY services to about 164 of them. 
Okay, thanks. And, and as a follow-up to that, these ESY programs, what percent of those are so-called in-district or are out-of-district out, out third-party programs? Sure. Uh, I mean, I would say for mine, 95% uh, are, are in district. Very, we have very few that are out of district. Okay. Just I wanted to follow up with that. The ESY services, we do offer ESY um, program here at Methacton for K through 12. We, though, we also have students who have more significant needs or, or needs that are outside of what we provide. We have expanded what Methacton School District provides in ESY services. So we're constantly looking at student need and working to provide that, serve, that ESY service here at Methacton. We also are very cognizant of looking at programs that are closer to student homes so that the, they're not spending time in you know, transportation, but really it's connecting the need with the program. Other, Mr. Pelican? So I know you said the um, seven factors of eligibility were um, I guess, you know, regulation driven. Um, but overall, the program that's delivered, I mean, would you say it's, it's consistent that with other, what other districts provide and or do we ever benchmark ourselves against other districts to see kind of how we measure up? I would say that what we offer our students at Methacton School District is far and above what other districts are doing for, for their students. And I'm, of course, I'm, I'm a little biased on that. But I am, you know, I am very committed to making sure that our students receive the very best that we have to give them. We have um, a tutoring program. We have an ESY program that goes from 9 to 1 that's located at Skyview over the summer. We have the best of the best teachers coming back in the summer to provide that tutoring for students. We choose only student um, programs that are out of district that I know that I've gone to each one of them and talked to folks and really done the exploration to make sure that what the services that the students are getting are you know top notch um, and I know that you know we're just we really work hard to make sure that it's a number one stuff for our kids. Um, you mentioned that the K to four 164 out of the 200 IEPs receive the ESY service, but for the high school, only 40 out of the 255. Is there a reason? Is it just the age that more participate? Yes, it's basically the age. What we find with students who get older, they're less likely to want to participate. So we do some things differently in their school day through the school year. Um, I know that at the elementary and the middle grades, there's a lot of students who may be uh, speech only. Um, in that disability category who may qualify for that and as the as they get older they're they're exited from that so that's part of it there's also you know the age at the elementaries um, I'm speaking specifically of the program we run at Skyview from K through six we we do a nine to one program but as the students get older it's more of a tutoring model so that's a two-hour tutoring window for for those students and then again at the high school it just becomes very difficult because uh, you know I'm happy to report that a lot of our students are involved in the sports and simply don't don't have those times we find that at the high school it's our more significantly disabled students who provide in, who, who participate in the ESY programs so do they have to sign out? I mean, opt out? Is there something they have to sign that says we offered it to you and we're not accepting? Yes. What, when the team, the team um, determines eligibility, if it is determined that the student is eligible, then we would offer a NORAP, a Notice of Recommended Educational Placement, with the exact ESY programming on it. And parents can then either accept that or reject that. If I get a rejection, and I know um, Ms. Faustin and Mr. Murch also will call the parent and make sure that they understand exactly what's happening. Um, and then we kind of go on from there and provide those services. Like I said, some few handful of students have other things going on, so they don't want that service. But the majority of the kids who it's offered to are taking us up on that. OK. Other questions? Mr. Phillips? Good evening. Um, other than the information you gave us, is there anything that you want to tell the board if there's any issues, problems, anything that the board needs to address with the program or that you need help with or is everything 
for the most part running smooth. Actually, I would say I, I think the, the, the team here at Pupil Services does a great job working together and problem solving. So we're doing great, but thank you for your offer. Other questions? Okay, well thank you for the report and especially thank you for everything you do with the kids every day. We appreciate it. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to questions on Dr. Zerbe's field report. Any questions for Dr. Zerbe? Mr. McFarland. Um, sorry, I was on the wrong page. <clears throat> the um, field lighting, is there any, Frank, maybe you know this, is there any indication as to when a hearing might be scheduled in terms of how far out it is, weeks or months? We just finalized the uh, the issue with regard to the parties. Uh, certain individuals had filed a uh, petition to be parties in the Court of Common Pleas, and that's been greatly pared down from about 17 or 20 parties that entered before the War Sister Group uh, to uh, to about eight parties uh, that are uh, that are in now. That was just done last week, so we'll be filing our brief uh, either the end of this week or Monday, and then filing a. Uh, uh, a, a precipice for uh, for argument with that, and then we'll wait for the court to schedule that. Okay, and the court the court schedules are impossible to predict. I mean, is it thirty days, ninety days? Or not? I would I would say maybe maybe sixty days. I mean, the, the way the way we've configured this, and we did it some time ago, uh, was to make sure that we essentially bifurcated the process so that the entire field building with the conduit would be one part of the process. And then depending upon when we got an ultimate approval, uh, we'd have to, uh, to locate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the poles for the lights and the, lo the location of those. And we'd then plug those in as, as almost like a stage two, if you will, if it couldn't be done at the same time. So we have every eventuality covered. It's just a question of, of when that ultimate decision would come in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just one other, if I may. Um, the project is, I think, estimated to be four weeks behind, and there are 15 weeks left to mid-August. So is there a plan in place that's a 25% roughly increase in speed to get that in done on time? Yeah, we had, uh, we actually, uh got to many of those issues today at our construction meeting and in, in fact uh, what we're looking to do with the help of the township and and I, I received a call uh, just before the meeting here today that uh, the township's willing to to work with us to expedite the review of certain uh, phase two uh, permits so that we can move the timeline uh, closer into the middle of May and pick up, you know, nearly 15 days in, in the matter. That's that's step one, and we have, we're looking at some other alternatives as well. But there are some things on the table right now that look promising to help us get uh, to the end result that we that we'd like to see. Other questions for Dr. Zerby? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item number six: reports. Start with finance committee, Mr. Pelicano. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Finance Committee met on April 21st at the Farina Center, and all members were present for the meeting. There were six topics on our agenda. Um, the first was a new Pennsylvania Department of Education account code structure, which uh, Mr. Light White Leather reviewed this, uh, the code changes required by PD, noting that um, uh, this will be required for the current fiscal year we're presently in. Um, there was some discussion really about the cost benefit of such a change mid-year um, and there was also some discussion around groups that are lobbying PD to potentially uh, slow this down or maybe stop this uh, pr uh, proposed change in the year. But nonetheless, Mr. White Leather um, talked about how his team was working hard to try and get ready for this change, um, nonetheless to be ready for this particular uh, fiscal year. And there was, it was taking some dedicated resources to really get this done, but um, they aren't scheduled to meet the requirement um, should that go through. The uh, next item on the agenda was a proposal for an additional uh, advisor. Um, Mr. White Leather also reviews, reviewed an a, a, a proposal to utilize an additional advisor for future debt issuance and refinancing needs. Um, the district currently uses public financial management, or PFM, and a second advisor would be added, um, would be the Royal Bank of Canada as, a, as an additional, I guess, as an underwriter. And it was noted that both of these firms um, were well-known players in the market. And there was also some discussion about the cost and performance should this um, 
uh, arrangement go through. Uh, Mr. Whiteleather assured us that there would be no additional cost associated with using um, two different parties here. Um, and in fact, many districts in the Commonwealth use this type of arrangement and they see benefit in this by having a second set of eyes on the possible um, refinancing. So, and no, no additional deterioration of service is noted by any of the advisors. So, um, as far as we're concerned, it looks like we're going to move forward with a recommendation to do that. The next item on the agenda was the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit Medical Access Agreement and Mr. White Leather reviewed this uh, medical access services that are provided by the MCIU and the contract uh, that we would like to execute for the 15-16 fiscal year. The cost to provide the service is about 8% of the generated revenues or approximately 16,000 based on the last fiscal year and the committee does recommend, uh, did recommend uh, the approval to the full board uh, pending any final review of uh, the contract by um, council. Uh, the next item was a 15-16 budget update. Mr. White Leather also provided a summary update on where we stood with respect to the draft budget. Really, there had been no really significant changes since the, the March uh, meeting. However, the administration was confident that um, based on where we stand now, we are able to get the deficit below the current Act 1 index. So that was a positive uh, development. Uh, we expect that the May 18th meeting, which is coming up next month, that the, uh, the committee will be providing updates, on, obviously, on the full budget um, to be advertised, as well as any potential changes in our early retirement program that was offered to professional staff. There were some also discussions around the state budget and the ongoing uh, work that's being done there. Uh, right now, we believe it's prudent that our district will, uh, our budget process will reflect no additional state funding increases other than what we typically get for PISERS and FICA reimbursements. There's also a discussion about the state's fair funding formula and the possibility that in the future, possible future changes could have a negative impact on our budget, so we're going to have to continue to monitor that closely. And lastly, again, the proposed final adoption of, of the budget will occur um, in May. Uh, with final adoption slated for later in June. The fifth item was the monthly financial reports review. Um, Mr. White Leather re uh, also reviewed various financial reports as of March 31st. There was a lot of questions from the committee, um, ra topics ranging from remaining spend in certain categories as well as the nature of uh, certain payments that were made. Lastly, the sixth item was the 2015-16 bid summary, and Mr. White Leather also reviewed the bid summary for the 15-16 year for instructional supplies. Several board members asked questions, including you know, differential and supply requests at the various buildings. Um, the board um, requested the administration uh, continue to encourage the full utilization of the bid process and limit any exceptions to a, a true business need. And lastly, the courtesy of floor, a number of questions were asked by uh, a bunch of folks ranging from uh, our plans to replenish the capital reserve to projected surplus for the current fiscal year to future uh, updates on the budget projection, as well as um, there was some discussion about basic education uh, funding for the 15-16 fiscal year. And that concludes my report. Thank you. We will on the property committee, Mr. Phillips. Yes, thank you. Our meeting was held on uh, Monday, April 13th, 7.30 in the morning. Uh, everybody was in attendance. Our discussion topics were uh, some color selections for the structures on the field project, which uh, we decided that it would be best to uh, follow a consistent theme uh, following along with the baseball park. Um, also, uh, the ESCO, that investment grade audit startup, uh, they'll have a phase one report uh, in about May. Also, we discussed the exterior lighting at the high school here, uh, being that we're going to be uh, changing to a nighttime use uh, with the fields and have many people attending that. And also, uh, just even indoor. Uh, operations. Uh, it's, it gets quite dark out in the parking lot and the walkways and I think they need addressed. Um, and that's something that's going to be uh, part of uh, Snyder's evaluation. Also, uh, we discussed uh, a future RFP for uh, long-term facility planning. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, Snyder Hoffman or Snyder Electric, sorry, 
uh, they're doing the energy part of it, but we also need to evaluate uh, all the structures and uh, grounds of the school district, uh, especially with uh, the potential of Autobahn and Arrowhead. Um, Dave gave you an update on the f field, and uh, that's about where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to Human Resources Committee, Mr. Roth. Thank you. I'm going to actually defer to um, Mrs. Hackett as I was not at this meeting. I was out. Thank you. So the uh, HR committee meeting was held on April the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Present from the board were Mrs. Woodring and myself, uh, and staff were uh, Dr. Zerby and uh, Mr. Harney. Uh, we received an update on open positions that have been posted within the district. There were seven at the time. Um, we had a review of the human resources actions that are being presented at our meeting tonight and a review of the Act 153 requirements. Um, we also were given, as we had requested, a, an outline of the process for hiring professional staff. That concludes my report. Why don't you continue on with education? Okay. The Education Committee met on Tuesday, March 31st at 7 p.m. Um, Mrs. Katona reviewed the curriculum cycle as it is currently and noted that she and her staff are working on updates as it is aligned for consistency throughout the grades. And the format that's been developed provides an easy view of the status of development for each of the curriculum areas. She noted that there will be a board report on math in May as we are completing a year of the math pilot project. Dr. Anstad presented an overview of the student assistance program, which is a program mandated by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. She noted that the IU trained staff and the parents are involved in this very structured program. Uh, it was noted that there will be a two-day STEM immersion workshop, probably at the IU. Several Ms. Saxon staff members and two board members are expected to participate. The district enrollment report as of March 27, 2015 was distributed for board information, and this report will be distributed monthly to the board. The committee discussed the sequence of reports to be provided to the committee on an ongoing basis. It was suggested that the three-year plan for professional development would be laid out, followed up by semi-annual reports, with the first report to be available probably at the end of, the May, at end of May for the June meeting. Reports on the guidance department with college-bound counseling matters included, as well as co-curricular and extracurricular reports will be on a schedule. There was further discussion on the alma mater, and it was decided to defer further discussion until December 2015 because of other pressing education issues. PVAS reporting will be included in the board's Friday update. The committee requested that a school visitation schedule for board members be developed. Uh, it was also noted that the PSSAs would be coming up within two weeks and then the PVAS. Discussion was held concerning the scheduling of reports by principals at board meetings and also on the rollout of the BYOD program. Uh, there were several uh, comments uh, from members of the audience uh, questioning about uh, what, what happens when children move from one school to another, what curriculum issues are faced as children move from one level to another with a note that the elementary schools, Beth Acton does a very good job. What happens in the SAT pro, SAP program when parents don't agree? Also, have we considered offering the SAP program in fifth and sixth grade, as could be very much needed at younger ages? Uh, another member of the public mentioned that the school visitations are vital. Questions about whether the bus drivers participate in the SAP program, and kudos on the bus drivers. Um, there was a question about the projected enrollment for Audubon for next year, and a question on the kindergarten registration, particularly considering we had glitches concerning the snow. And our next and last curriculum council meeting takes place next week on May 6th. That's it. Thank you. Communications and Community Relations, Mr. McFarland. Thank you. Uh, the Communications Committee met on April 7th at 8 a.m. 
myself, Ms. Barone, Dr. Zerbe, and Ms. Lynch were in attendance, and Ms. Hackett was also there as a non-committee member. Uh, Mrs. Lynch gave us an update on the prior month's uh, readership, and it was noted that an increase of over 100 from the previous month uh, of readership from the uh, website. So that continues to increase, although most of that, as we know, is um, open and connected to parents currently with children in school, less so to those uh, citizens who don't have children in school. But on that uh, issue, we also were informed that the school board meeting broadcasts uh, have increased since the board newsletter has been initiated, and more significantly since the consolidation hearings began. Prior to the newsletter, the average was 40 to 80 uh, views per month on the cable network. Since the hearings have begun, there have been 677 views, so that's uh, helpful in many ways for more people to, uh, to hear and see what the issues are. Uh, so we continue to pursue ways to uh, broaden our reach with the newsletter and the update, and um, we'll continue to meet with that topic uh, monthly. We discuss topics for the next monthly update. May's update will primarily focus on goals since the school board this year established written goals we have decided to provide a partial update. We're not going to cover all the goals in one issue. Um, and there will be a couple of other items of interest as well. And we'll continue each month to probably add a, a goal or two as an update to keep the public informed of our progress in those, uh, in those areas. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Glad to hear we're doing well in the Nielsen ratings. Uh, moving on to policy committee, Mrs. Ms. Woodring. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, the policy committee met on Wednesday, April 8th, with all of our members present. We undertook a very ambitious agenda with over 20 policies under review to the degree that we had to recess and reconvene. So uh, the outcome of that was pretty uh, positive. We've got on the agenda tonight nine policies for a first review and I think two for second. Um, one of the policies that we talked about at some length was the volunteer policy, the issue of insurance uh, with Dr. Zerbe's further investigation and a recommendation. Uh, the committee is uh, presenting to the full board a recommendation to reinsert uh, insurance coverage language into that policy. And finally, with the volunteer policy, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Harney and Ms. Lynch for helping uh, go over our update of the volunteer manual, which at some point in the near future would be available for review and finalization. That's it. Thank you. Intermediate unit, Mr. Phillips. Good evening. We opened our, our building and uh, our new building and had our cer opening ceremony on Friday. If you get your chance to get down there, it's a very beautiful building. It's well done. Uh, also, our former IU building, we have uh, two interested parties in the purchase of it. Uh, so that's exciting uh, if that comes to fruition. And uh, so that's all I have to report right now. Thank you. How about you uh, and Ms. Woodring stick around for North Monaco Technical Career Center? Alrighty, thank you. Um, let's see, we met on the 20th of April as a joint operating committee. We finalized the 1516 budget at just over $9 million. Our share of that uh, is one of the five sending schools is about $1.2 million to include our debt service over there. Uh, we've finalized their net proceeds from their spring fling, which uh, benefited Anthony Flick. I think last time I had reported they had estimated it was over 20,000, and their final figures are 24,000 for that young man. So they were very, very proud of themselves for raising that kind of money uh, for that uh, student. Uh, at the Pennsylvania Farm Show and Skills USA competitions, uh, five uh, award winners to include a best of 
show went to Methacton, and that was a dish garden presented out of the horticulture and landscape uh, program at the Pennsylvania Farm Show. And finally, the Senior Project Expo will be held on May 19th <coughs> from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., where students will demonstrate knowledge and skills representing their 22 different program areas at the Tech Center. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, anything to add or are you good? Great. Moving on to student board representatives. Thank you. Uh, on April 24th, Smith Acton had their annual prom at the Franklin Commons. Many kids enjoyed the safe and fun activity in their best attire. Additionally, post-prom ended up to be a great activity that contributed to a long night of fun, so I do congratulate everybody who contributed to that. Um, tomorrow there will be an orchestra concert at the high school. Um, we look forward to seeing our high school students portray their musical talents. On May 7th, looking to the future, um, some my kids from the math club will be attending a uh, math competition at Temple University and we look forward to seeing some awards from that. Um, also on behalf of the NHS committee uh, for fundraising for the Mother's Day baskets, Akriti and I would like to thank all those who have donated and we, have, we anticipate enough donations to um, meet our goal which is about 40 baskets for new and expecting mothers. Akriti? Thank you. Um, the math club participated in the Millersville math contest. Myth Acton placed second overall. Senior Kevin Liu tied for third, and senior um, Vinay Parakala finished with fifth. Students Michael Miller, Jennifer Zhang, and Sejal Suri have won the um, Future Scientist Award from the Eastern Regional uh, Research Center of the, U from, of the U.S. Department of Agriculture for their outstanding projects related to agriculture uh, research at the Delaware Valley Science Research Fair. Um, I would like to con congratulate Emily Chang, who received a gold medal, and freshman uh, Jeremy Wang, who received a silver medal for their performance in the Delaware Valley Science Fair. Uh, they will be, they'll both be going to the International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, AP students are preparing for their AP test um, which uh, starts next week and will end um, on the week of May 11th. Thank you. Thank you both. Communications, Ms. Lynch. In late April and May, several special events take place throughout the Methacton School District. As Akriti mentioned, uh, last week we had our 15th annual post-prom party and community walkthrough. Hundreds of students and community members experienced the area's premier post-prom event designed to provide students with a safe, fun after-prom experience. Hundreds and hundreds of parents participate in the preparation of the event and the breakdown, as well as staying with the students all night long. And uh, over 90% of our um, junior and senior students who attend the prom do stay for the post-prom event, which is very unusual in the, uh, in, in the Commonwealth. The annual Methacton High School Art Show will take place in the library at Methacton High School over three days, May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The entire community is invited to attend this amazing display. It showcases the skills and talents of art students enrolled in classes like advanced placement art classes, ceramics, computer art, photography, drawing, and painting. And the uh, second annual Methacton Technology Showcase will be held at the high school on May 27th. Students and teachers representing all grade levels will demonstrate how technology, devices, and in initiatives are integrated into our instructional programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Superintendent's Report, Dr. Zerby. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Hackett brought uh, your attention to STEM immersion. I just want to give the, the board a little bit more detail on the STEM immersion project. Resulting from my entry plan and as we work towards a preferred future, we have a free two-day STEM immersion planning workshop for, scheduled for May 11th and 12th at the Montgomery County IU. Uh, teachers, school counselors, administrators, community members, and school board members uh, will be engaged in an in-depth analysis uh, of our district with regards to STEM. That STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, a lot of times we also try to throw an A in there to get it 
disdain for our arts since you know we have we have such a strong tradition here in Methacton uh, with with not only our musical but our, our uh, visual arts as well. But upon completion, Asset STEM, a national science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics education improvement nonprofit established by the Bayer Corporation, uh, will provide a report uh, from the two-day planning session. Uh, we can then use that information um, to determine you know where we currently sit. As, as an organization and help us to make some decisions about you know how we can leverage uh, our, our internal resources and maybe resources of the community uh, to grow our programs as well. So there's a lot of good STEM related projects occurring throughout the district. There's STEM days, there's all sorts of, of activities. I think uh, this is a, a good act opportunity for us to get them all uh, documented under one roof and then from there determine you know, where we want to go in the future. So I look forward to that. I'll be participating in that. I know we have uh, Ms. Hackett, I think you're joining us for, for that. And we're looking for one other board member uh, for that particular uh, workshop. Um, the next thing on my uh, agenda of topics is co consolidation committee. I'd like to give the board and the public an update on that process. Um, I can tell you that the first meeting of the consolidation committee was held uh, on April 22nd, 2015. Uh, the enrollment capacity and education committee chairpersons distributed a list of questions uh, to their committee members on Friday, April 17th, uh, to their committee members. Uh, the list of questions were uh, designed to help uh, guide uh, a discussion and also to prepare a, a final uh, list of questions to be, to be delivered to the Pennsylvania Economy League for seeking their response in writing as well as, as a presentation. Uh, the finalized list is uh, planned for completion by Friday, May 1st. Uh, the next step will be to schedule a meeting whereby the entire consolidation committee uh, can hear the Pell presentation and ask any follow-up questions. Uh, this will likely occur in mid-May, mid and once completed, a date will be uh, scheduled uh, to provide the same information and presentation by Pell to the public and the Board of School Directors. Again, the purpose of, of these actions are to establish a baseline of information necessary to make future decisions. Uh, as such, uh, the basis for any potential school closing is predicated on the facts. And, uh, you know, although we know the facts of the past seven years with our enrollment decline, um, we need to combine that with what is projected into the future. And that's just what we're trying to do. This enrollment capacity uh, committee is trying to, to work with constituents of the community to help uh, bring uh, a finalization to the, the, the Pell study or some other, some other uh, uh, path that we may need to take. But we anticipate completing the baseline information process no later than the end of June of 2015. <laughs> In addition, uh, the redrawing of attendance areas committee met uh, with me as a temporary chairperson for, for that committee uh, to prepare a, requ a request for a proposal, essentially seeking um, vendors to help lead and assist us in, the, in potentially having to redraw boundary lines if that is necessary. Uh, lastly, the Finance Committee and the Student and Staff Transition Committee, although those members met with us at the beginning of, of the meeting on, the, uh, on April 22nd, uh, they, uh, their, their, their work was postponed until we bring forth uh, answers to questions on the enrollment and capacity studied by Pell. Uh, so with, with no uh, further comments on the Consolidation Committee, I just wanted to make sure that the Board and the public were, were aware of the progress that we're trying to make. Uh, the next item I have for the board um, is uh, legal representation. Uh, I want the board to be aware that I issued an RFP, a request for proposal for legal representation for special education and pupil services beginning July 1, 2015. Uh, the responses are due by May 13, 2015 and will be provided to a committee of the board for review and possible recommendation at the May 2015 meeting of the board. The next item I have uh, uh, are some student uh, news items. Uh, Tara Mehta, um, Methacton High School sophomore, has been uh, selected to receive a full merit-based scholarship uh, from the U.S. Department of State to study Arabic in Morocco this summer. Tara will live with a host family and attend a uh, local school for 20 hours of formal instruction as well as participate in cultural and community activities. Uh, congratulations, Tara. 
Uh, also want to congratulate Methacton Winter Color Guard for winning the Cavalcade Regional A Class uh, Championship on Saturday. Uh, Methacton won with a score of 92.8, more than two points higher than the strongest competitor from New Jersey. Methacton was promoted to this class of competition mid-season and has rallied back to win uh, the championship by the season's end. We're so proud of, of our uh, color guard. And I also want to congratulate uh, high school graduate uh, Michelle Conkley, who was recently named to the USA National Paralympic swim team. Michelle will compete in the 2015 World Swimming Championships this summer in Scotland. She was an outstanding athlete here at Methacton and we wish her the best of luck in her future endeavors. And lastly, um, I just want to, again, I know a lot of people said thank you to the, all the volunteers in the, in the post-prom, but um, if, if, if you had a chance to walk through that, um, you, you will clearly recognize uh, what a, an outstanding effort that all of our volunteers did. But I want to really bring uh, your attention to three young ladies that were kind of spearheading that particular process, uh, Dana Reddington, Kim Beam, and Karen Kilcore. I just want to say uh, personally and publicly, thank you for their efforts and uh, we, we uh, enjoyed the post-prom, even though I was only there for a little bit. Uh, I did want to ride the mechanical bull, but I wasn't allowed to. So at the end of the day, it's probably um, better that way. Probably, but but there is a photo of me on a tricycle. Uh, but I, I just I just you know I can't tell I can't tell the public and the board how uh, amazing that particular activity is. Um, I, in some of my previous uh, experience, I, I've been across the Commonwealth and many of the schools in the Commonwealth uh, through my work at, at, in, in the IU years ago. And uh, there's no such event that I've seen like that that brings the community and the school together uh, for a purpose to keep our children safe. So um, that's that's a, 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 a you know at the cornerstone of of, of our uh, of our makeup, and we want to do whatever we can to keep that thing moving forward. So I just want to say thank you to those ladies and all the volunteers. I believe that ends my report. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Uh, this concludes reports, so at this time I will open the floor for uh, the public comment on only on board action items, so if there's comments uh, that folks want to make during courtesy of the floor, they can do that, but this time I'd open the floor up for um, public comment on board action items for tonight. Um, when called upon, please come up, state your name and general location, and please keep your comments to three minutes. Ashley Wilkerson from Audubon. Uh, I just want to touch on the volunteer policy and say first that I'm delighted that the language was struck that uh, was originally requested to be reinserted regarding insurance for volunteers. Uh, for people who weren't here last meeting, um, I'll read this from the minutes from the policy committee meeting. The policy is revisited per the request of a board member to investigate the removal of language that indicated volunteers would be afforded the same insurance coverage as employees of the district. Dr. Zerby explains that this is not legally required and re was removed upon counsel from our solicitor. However, to reinsert the language would not be of any cost to the district. Dr. Zerby recommended the committee would reinsert the language. And so while I'm glad it's reinserted, I guess my question is what sort of procedure are we going through to investigate adding and subtracting information from policies before we go through with it? If it wasn't going to cost anything to the district to keep the language in there, why did we make the recommendation to remove it? Uh, is the litmus test whether or not something is legally required? And I would hope the answer is no. And I would offer that it probably isn't because if we only do what's legally required in this district, we wouldn't be putting in AstroTurf and a new concession stand because certainly that's not legally required. Um, I, I'm just concerned that that seems to be the litmus test for what's happening with a lot of the decisions being made for particularly the lower schools. Uh, and I hope that we won't continue to see that. Uh, the role of an attorney is to make advice and then we can either accept it or choose to move in a different direction. And I think this is a clear example of where uh, we're told that we can do something, but looking at the cost-benefit analysis, there's no cost and there's only a benefit to ensuring our volunteers. Why would we do this to begin with? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. <coughs> 
Joe Bickelman, Audubon, Pennsylvania. I have a question, uh, I have a comment about uh, item 9.4 on the agenda. Approve the administration to utilize the firms of public financial management as financial advisor and the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, as underwriter to the district. At the finance committee held last Tuesday, there was no mention of the word underwriter. Uh, it was just presented as RBC as being a financial advisor, which was a little confusing to some of the members and m myself. Um, we were wondering how public financial management, say they're getting $12,000 for the bond issue, now you have RBC coming in and no cost increase, so it was said that, you know, they'll each get $6,000 as financial advisor. And now it's in here as Royal Bank of Canada, RBC as underwriter. I'd just like to explain that a bond underwriter acts as a middleman purchasing bonds from the, the district at a discount and then reselling the bonds to investors. So they're coming to the district and saying, I'll give you $9,950,000 for your $10 million of bonds. So that $50,000 is the discount. And then that bond underwriter goes out and sells to investors. Seems different than what was talked about at the committee meeting last Tuesday. It was presented as two financial advisors which I didn't understand that since it's very easy to m monitor district debt and advise the district when it's appropriate to refinance. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know, is there any requ request for proposals to hire an underwriter? Did we go out and get RFPs? Is the district going to auction its bonds online? You know, that's where you get the best deal. You go online, you auction your bonds. I know we're refinancing some bonds and I don't think we sold them yet. And we go online and then an underwriter will buy that chunk of bonds and resell them, you know, out the back door to their investors. So we're hiring RBC as an underwriter, but that wasn't said at the finance committee meeting. Yeah, Mr. Bickelman, let me let me see if I can address that for you. Um, yeah, I need some clarification because that's no, no, you're you're, you're absolutely correct. Right. I mean, let me just let me just explain that. Um, the, the, the the at the finance committee meeting, we talked about uh, having RBC and uh, PFM be our our financial advisors, and we correct. talked about having them having that they do provide. Uh, those those uh, services that there will be no additional cost in fees and that if it was you mentioned a number of twelve thousand dollars if it's twelve thousand dollars they would split the fee that's what exactly what we said and that's exactly what we're still intending to do uh, we okay. were notified uh, recently that uh, under the Dodd Frank rule uh, when they when they went through the bank consolidation and uh, revamping of, of of the banking industry mm -hmm. that we couldn't we couldn't list these these for both firms as uh, both our financial advisors so currently right now what you, what you what what you need to know and what the board needs to know is we we are we are requesting that not only do they work together as in reviewing our financial uh, Debt. issues yeah. but but they they currently PFM is not only a financial advisor but RBC already does the underwriting for most if not all of our bonds so the what we're actually recommending is what we're kind of doing right now uh, but we're also asking them to uh, give us advice when when possible so, so we have a second set of eyes looking at the at the issues so they became the underwriters of the bond issues through competitive bid no, I didn't say that we did a competitive bid, nor did I say that no, for we did for online. No, for prior issues. I, I can't tell you that. I don't, believe, I don't believe that's the case. Okay. It was just confusing. You know, now you say you, you found it, it's, it, some law that says and that, that is you correct. can't so, list them so, both as financial so we're advisor. We're correcting it, and that's why the motion before the board is to have one as financial advisor, the other one as uh, underwriter. Okay, the last thing I have is a ethics form from Dr. Jeffrey Miller, and it lists here direct or indirect sources of income, 
and one of the companies is RBC Capital Markets. So I was just wondering, was he involved in the negotiations to be part of this? That's something to look at. I, yeah, I, I have not had any conversations whatsoever with Dr. Miller regarding this matter. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional courtesy of the floor, Mr. Andrews. John Andrews, Lower Providence. There's one small item on the uh, voting list, item 13.3, a uh, Hershey Park trip for the, uh, I think it's the uh, main exchange. The main exchange program. I, I don't, I don't know much about the main exchange program, but I think it's an educational endeavor. But. You know, I challenge you to show me a policy that says, you know, kids, you can take the day off and have fun on the roller coaster. Uh, and uh, it's, it's scheduled for this Friday, one, day, one school day, uh, and, and the cost is substitutes, an, un, an undetermined number. But if it's not an educational activity, it seems to me that you don't get the state subsidy for, for the students that go on that trip for that day. Uh, this is akin to my commenting on the, uh, the Western U.S. Uh, ski trips that have occurred to the last two years. Uh, I, I, uh, I just don't see where it's a wise use of our money, it's a wise place to send our students, and, and I think the students that don't go, I don't know what their feelings are, but they might have some wondering also. So I, uh, I, I challenge you to show me a policy that, that approves such a trip. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Reese, Lower Providence. I wanted to um, thank all of you for, the e, for your commitment to the ESY. Um, and I wanted to thank Mr. Phillips for asking that question about what else do the special ed supervisors, do you need anything? Because that's not often something that we hear. Um, so thank you for that. And I will say that w uh, the elementary supervisor mentioned 160 out of 200 students, which is a huge ratio. Um, a lot of times in districts, parents are fighting for those services. So I will say thank you for your commitment to that. I wanted to just reiterate the SAP comments that were made at the Education Committee meeting um, that uh, Mrs. Hackett mentioned. Um, I also sent an email to Dr. Angstad. Um, and I look forward to hearing how the meeting went, goes with PDE. Um, I did a little digging. So and Andrew, there, do you have specific comments on action items? Well, I apologize. I thought the... This is board I thought, action items. So okay. Courtesy I'll of wait. Floor, That's fine. I just thought an action item could be committee report. That Ms. Hackett brought it up. Action items they were going to vote on. Okay. I'll see you at courtesy of the floor. Excuse me. Good evening, my name is Preston Lutweiler, I'm from Lower Providence, and um, I'm trying to navigate, you know, just what are action items and aren't action items and when we can speak about what, but I think I've figured out that I can talk about this issue under 9.4, which is the financial advisors issue, and the fact that you've just mentioned that RBC is your bond underwriter. I just have one question, I viewed the uh, video from the March meeting, I'm one of those people who have added to your um, count of people who are viewing your, your meetings. And um, you issued some authorized issuing of some bonds with some stated savings of interest. Um, and there were just general parameters, you know, not to exceed or, you know, the, the high level. And it occurred to me at that time to ask whether you actually and when you would let 
the public know and when you would discuss at your meeting what the actual interest rate was, what the savings was from those bonds that were issued, and whether we know how much the bond council fees were for those bonds. Thank you. We, w we will, if you would be so kind, uh, sir, if you would be so kind to uh, share your email address with, uh, with Angela here, we can get the, that information and we'll also post it on the website for you. Perfect, okay. thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment on action, action items. Okay. Candy Alaba, Eggerville. Uh, item 9-5, your medical access, medical access services. I don't have any issue with the services. My only comment is you're voting on this contract for a year, but it's pending solicitor's review. Wouldn't it be more prudent to have the solicitor go over everything and find out it's everything's all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, then vote to approve the agreement? Because if you approve it tonight, what happens if you run across some issues that you have to deal with and the agreement's already proved? So I think maybe you should have the solicitor review it, then vote on it instead of putting the cart before the horse. Candy, thank you so much for your comment. Um, and, and we try on every occasion to try to make sure that the solicitor has the contract well in advance uh, before a meeting, but in order to get things in, in, in order to uh, you know, get hit some timing marks that we're looking for, we sometimes have to bring items before the board uh, to vote on principle of the item pending the solicitor's review. Um, if we find that uh, the review by the solicitor uh, puts the district at any uh, disadvantage, we will then bring that back to the board to their attention and we would certainly uh, you know, not finish the, uh, the execution of the contract. But in, in, in the, the intent here this evening is simply to uh, get the board's approval that on the principle of the contract uh, that we can move forward with the matter because this program is important to us and I think we, we, we generated about 200 plus thousand dollars as a result of uh, working with the IU and we think the relationship because of their expertise in this matter is important for us to continue. So thank you. We, well, we, we, we need to get it moving so that as of, as of July 1, they can have the staffing appro appropriated to uh, meet our needs. Any additional public comment on board action item? Okay, seeing none, we'll move into item number eight, board meeting minutes. I will ask for a motion to approve the board meeting minutes of March 24th, 2015. Is there a motion? Mrs. Barone, is there a second? Mrs. Woodring, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? You're opposed? Okay, so uh, I abstain. Uh, so we have six, four, one against, one abstention. I'm abstaining because I was absent due to uh, work travel. Okay, moving on to fiscal items. Uh, Mr. Whiteleather. Uh, thank you, a couple items on for this evening. Item 9.1, monthly list of bills uh, as reviewed uh, and approved by uh, Finance Committee for your approval this evening. 9.2 is our monthly Treasurer's Report, also reviewed uh, by Finance Committee uh, for your approval this evening. Item 9.3 is the annual bid summary as uh, provided during the Finance Committee report uh, for the annual instructional supplies throughout the district for the 2015 16 uh, school year uh, attached for your review. Item 9.4, uh, financial advisors as discussed and presented this evening, um, RBC and PFM will be operating in a, in a dual advisory role uh, for the benefit of the school district uh, and analyze any future financing uh, refunding needs as needed uh, for the district. And lastly, uh, item 9.5, Medical access again reviewed and recommended by Finance Committee uh, relative to our 2015 16 medical access services um, as stipulated at the uh, cost of 8% of uh, earned uh, fees for the school district, which amounted to $200,000, uh, a little over $200,000 for last year. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White Leather. Okay, before I ask for a motion, um, are there any that anyone wants to take separately? Mr. Phillips? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to break out uh, 
nine four and nine five separately. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'll ask for a motion to approve items nine dot one through nine dot three of the list of bills, the treasurer's report, and the bid summary. Is there a motion? Mr. McFarland, is there a second? Ms. Hackett, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Eight to zero. Okay, item number 9.4, financial advisors. There is a request for a motion to approve the administration to utilize the firms of PFM as financial advisor and RBC, um, World Bank of Canada, RBC as underwriter to the district. Is there a motion? Mr. Pelicano, is there a second? Ms. Hackett, discussion. Mr. Phillips? Um, this is something that I've always asked, and uh, Mr. Bickelman uh, brought it up, and that was about uh, Dr. Miller's ethics form uh, with RBC. Also, um, when this was looked at, is there any companies or firms that are within the United States? Uh, this is something that on the IU, when we put out uh, for our loans, uh, for instance, uh, First Niagara, uh, they're uh, a Canadian based, and my suggestion was to look at the local banks, pull a couple of the banks together to give us funding and at least keep the money within our county, within our state, and look at that. Just as this with the financial advisors, um, what what have we looked at? What have we eliminated through a process um, to get to these guys? And I, you know, they've been around a long time with us, and sometimes it's nice to look outside the box. Uh, I think just in uh, response to some of your comments, Mr. Phillips, um, certainly um, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of makes, on, in a general sense, uh, uh, good to try to keep money in the county or in, in the community whenever we can, especially when we're looking at contracts or other types of, of areas. But in this case, um, both RBC and PFM are the two largest uh, public school financing institutions in, in, in the country. And uh, by, by, by that alone, they allow and they bring resources uh, to public schools like Methacton or other, other school districts across the Commonwealth that many uh, banks wouldn't be able to, to bring forward as, as a matter of assisting us in this matter. So this is a, these are, these are big time uh, and, and, and uh, important matters that uh, we're, we're trusting to the two largest uh, groups that provide this service. And uh, this is the recommendation that um, many school districts currently have in place. Um, in, even in my, uh, 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 the former district that I came from, uh, we had uh, both of these uh, uh, companies uh, provide uh, financial uh, advising and underwriting services to the district. And uh, you'll find that they're uh, predominantly through, uh, recognized throughout the Commonwealth for those types of services. So the, the recommendation that we brought before the, uh, uh, the Finance Committee was just that. Um, we, we currently use PFM and we just want to make sure that um, uh, f at no additional cost that we have another set of eyes on our books. And at the end of the day, um, it's our belief that, you know, that this is, this, getting the two biggest players in the game to, to look at it uh, makes sense to us. So let me, let me ask one question. Um, so Mr. Pelicano's report was that the, the recommendation, and I think the, the, to the Finance Committee and other Finance Committee was to hire them both as advisors. We have RBC as underwriter, but you're saying they're also going to act as an advisor. That, that is correct. So should this motion not be RBC as advisor and underwriter to the district, or am I parsing this too much? It should be as it stated. Okay. Other questions or again, you know, the part of the part of the problem is 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 uh, as, as superintendent of schools, um, I'm not very familiar with the the the, the Dodd Frank rules. I mean, it just you know, the banking industry isn't necessarily the stuff I deal with on a daily basis. So when we talk about stuff in finance, we basically say. 
you know, these are going to be our co-advisors. And then we later find out, well, under the, under the rules, this is how it has to be uh, done. And, and so all we're asking you is not that we're having a contract with them. It's that you're giving us permission to utilize their services in the event, uh, any future events, to, to address both underwriting and or uh, financial adv advisement. So it's not, it's not a contract. Um, we're, not, we're not engaged with them as a result of this action. You're just giving us the authority to engage them in matters that come before us. If we decide at a, at a later date that you need, or that there's a, a substantial reason for us to look elsewhere, I mean, that's something we ought to discuss well, then. I, and I'm just thinking as, as we go along here, um, maybe, maybe it'd be easier I didn't make the motion, but maybe we, uh, if Greg would amend his motion that we ask uh, RBC to list what uh, Dr. Miller worked on, uh, and I, I'd like to I'd like to see what what he did for them that he put it on his ethics form. Go I on. think I I don't know. Uh, hold, just give me one second. I just wanted to check with the solicitor that we weren't talking about things that I wasn't allowed to talk about. Okay. Uh, so again, um, I, I want to make sure that if, if you if, if you or the board's requesting the administration to do something, then we need the, the board to uh, you know take a motion and, and 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 ask us to look into some information that apparently is a concern of at least one board member at this point in time. I and mean, this is new information to us, so I'm not sure why we're, we're having this conversation this evening, but um, you know. The board needs to make a decision here. I'm not, I, I can't take direction from one board member on this matter. What, Mr. Phillips, what is your concern? I mean, what is the concern about Dr. Miller's and his ethics statements? Do you have a, a concern that there was some inappropriateness or something? Um, yes, back, a uh, little history. Back when uh, Skyview uh, was on the books and when Dr. Malik got the plan con B voided, one of the things that came out was when Dr. Miller was out in Dolphin County. He did a five, six school out there. The architect, the bond company was the same out there as here. Uh, the night that Dr. Malik uh, got injured was the night that he asked the board if there was any conflicts of interest. A simple question, uh, the only question he asked that evening. And this is one of the things that we heard. Later, Dr. Miller then retires from the district and that following year, on his ethics form, he now has that. So it's always been out there, and I think the district needs to know, going forward, what his status was and what he did for RBC uh, during that time frame. And at the time frame that he put that on his ethics form, he was a consultant for us, and we were paying him 500 and some dollars a day per diem. So, I, you know, just to put some stuff to rest, I think this is something that we have to I mean, find out. You're, you're bringing up past history here. I don't know how that relates to the motion on the floor here. We have a constituent in the audience that brought this to us. This has been something that's been not addressed over the years. It's been brushed off by the board, by the super, former superintendent, and it's something that I'd like to put to bed. You, you know, here we are, we're potentially shutting down two schools, and I'll say two schools because that's w what we looked at as an option from the beginning. And the whole reason why we even are looking at that option is because we built Skyview, and here we are. Okay, so, so that's, well, so that's where I'm so at. So your point's taken. You want information on Dr. Miller's involvement. Ms. Hackett, you had a... Yes, I just wanted to uh, clarify this. We did discuss it at great length at the Finance Committee meeting. And if I understand how these processes work, having gone through them a few times, these people don't make any money from us until we make a further decision. Is that correct? That is correct. 
So it's up to us to make the decision at the time that they present something to us. This is just to authorize you to use two sets of eyes. Okay, so I think we'll a way forward. Let me see if anyone else has any comments. Any other comments? So I think there's two options. So a board member has brought up concerns um, in regards to at least one of these advisors. So we can either A, table this and get more information or um, to take a vote. You have something you want to say? Go ahead. I just want to make it clear that um, as part of uh, a board motion and, uh, that I'm only looking at the closure of one school. Okay. I think I, I, just, I, just, a, I, I know. I just, I just want to make that. that I just want to make that clear. I, I okay. understand, but it, it, the fact is, when the utilization study came back, it was I, I'm, uh, under, understood. I, I just yeah, didn't he, want to confuse anybody here at the table or in the public. He's he's making a statement about the capacity issues that came from from Scott. I, I understand. Okay, so. Um, you, I'm assuming you're not withdrawing your motion. That's correct. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor with a second. Any further discussion? Just, just one point I would make is that because of the shadow with RBC, I would probably be in favor of tabling this and, and voting on it after we clear this up once and for all. Although I agree with Mr. Pelicano, I don't think it has any impact whatsoever on our current needs. Yeah. Um, I would just like to see it taken off the. There's certainly enough information. I, I just I probably won't vote for it just because there's too much swirl. Um, but. You made the motion, so you have to draw it if you want to do that. The, the one last thing I would say is, uh, here, here's an opportunity. To go. Once we vote on well, RBC to, okay. Was there a motion to table? No. No, there wasn't. There's not. There's not. So, so there's no motion to table. You're not withdrawing. There's a, there's a second. If there's any further discussion. Yeah. The point I was going to make was, uh, we're at a point here where RBC, if we vote in favor of it, what's RBC's, why would they respond to us, uh, you know, if we ask well, them a question? So I, mean, I think that they still have, they have to respond because they're not getting paid anything until we actually make a decision and have them use them. So um, there's still leverage there. But if there's no other, Ms. Byrne? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, with all of the confusion that's happening, can we table this? Can we make a motion to table this now that he's made a motion? Can we make additional motion to table? And we can come back to this next month? Sure. Okay. So but somebody I, has to make that. I will make the motion to table this until we can figure out what this information is and if it's relevant. I, I would like to second that. Okay. I'd just like to understand what, what exactly are we going to do, though? I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to dig up old past to try and understand some of the issues? Uh, Greg, side you, or? Greg, let me go in, into that with you, too, because while I firmly believe that the Finance Committee did their homework on this, and given the basis of what that motion is that you presented on the table, uh, and what um, and what Mr. Phillips brought up, are two totally different issues. However, given the fact that it's it's a it's a matter of public meeting and a public discussion and all that, I think it would be prudent that the issue be tabled until Mr. Phillips is. Um, you know, issues are resolved or brought out or cleared up and then brought back to the board for, for a continuing vote on so, that. So I think item. to Mr. Pelicano's point, we need to know what, what are we asking for? Like, what, what do we want to know? So, to do yeah, we got to direct the superintendent to do something, otherwise it's just tabled and... Right. And that's... So if you table, if the, if the board votes to table this, then it's... So what do we, what do we want to find? I mean, I... I I think we can ask RBC, or we can go back and research how they got initially engaged with the district. I mean, I think that would be that would be appropriate. Well, I, I'd like to know from them what he worked on. Well, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to tell you that. Well, uh, it's let it inquire. I mean, let's start there. Inquire. Yeah, you know, what was he being paid for? What was his role? What the the whole nine yards? I, I mean, it's. And maybe there's nothing, maybe there's something. I, but we, we have to at least ask. Let me, let, me, let me just jump in here, Jim. I, I, think, I think the most you're going to get from them, and I may be wrong, but I think the most you're going to get from them is a comment as to what matters he may have worked on, if any, that had interaction with the fact the school district. I don't think you're going to get information from, uh, from a vendor as to uh, what 
interaction an individual who is not here any longer had with them in the general business sense uh, when they uh, when they may have employed or may still have a relationship with them. So I don't think you're going to get that. And I think really what you're looking for is whether there was any, any interaction on their behalf with Methacton School District. That's really what you're looking for. And if you get the assurances from them that there was not, then you can move on from there. All right, so we have a motion to table, which has been seconded. So all those in favor of tabling? Opposed? Okay, so that passes. And then unless there's any objection, I'll direct the superintendent to um, find out if, uh, if the previous superintendent was is currently, in which way they're engaged. He can work with the solicitor on what exactly he can ask. And then also get the board some history on when RBC initially engaged with the district. How about, a, how about if, if we just ask um, uh, whether, and we will mention uh, uh, Dr. Miller's name in there, uh, but ask uh, what business activities uh, they have ongoing with Methacken School District and how those business activities uh, began uh, and whether uh, Dr. Miller or any other individual who was employed by Methacken uh, has been involved with them. Does that alleviate everyone's concern or will that alleviate everyone's concerns? And also, if there's any compensation due to them on anything that we do. That's a big issue. T. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Moving on to item 9.5. Did you? Did you? Well, I'm fine. directing you. You, 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 you don't, that yeah. Thing. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Fine with that. Um, 9.5, ask for a motion to approve the medical access services agreement with the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit for a period of one year. Additional terms are stipulated within the agreement, and this would be pending solicitor's review. Is there a motion? Mrs. Barone, is there a second? Mr. McFarland, discussion. The only thing I wanted to say, I sit on the board and I want to recuse myself from that vote. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And abstentions. Okay, passes. Thank you. Moving on to personnel items, Mr. Harney. Yes, we have two resignation classifieds for your approval this evening. We have one employment professional, which is a replacement position. We have one employment classified, one employment long term substitute classified. We have one change of status. We have one compensated leave professional. We have one uncompensated leave professional. We have one uncompensated leave classified and one supplemental contract for your approval. We're also asking for your approval of the attached volunteer list. Thank you, Mr. Harney. Um, does anyone want to take any of these separately? Okay. Then I will ask for a motion to approve all items in item 10, personnel items. That's 10.1 through 10.13. Is there a motion? Ms. Woodring, is there a second? Mr. Phillips, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Eight to zero. Thank you. Moving on to item number 11, curriculum and programs. Ms. Katona. Uh, this evening you see um, four different textbooks that are on the docket for adoption. Um, last month uh, I brought these to you and explained that they would be on display for 30 days, which they were. Uh, the public could come in and review them, uh, ask questions, provide feedback. I did not receive any questions or feedback on them. Uh, so I am asking for you to approve these textbooks uh, for their use in um, 15, 16 and beyond. <coughs> And then the uh, second item is the French Immersion Program. Uh, in February, we are uh, seeking to have a group of students, about 15 students and two teachers, uh, travel to France. Uh, all trip costs will be paid for by the students. Um, we will have the substitute costs for the teachers. Uh, in October, students from France will come here uh, for a period of time as well. Great, thank you. Um, anyone want to take any of these separate? Okay, 
Then I'll ask for a motion to approve items 11.1 and 11.2, the textbook adoption of the four textbooks as listed and the French immersion program. Mr. Pelicano, is there a second? Ms. Hackett, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Eight to zero. Brings us to item 12, policy. Dr. Zerby. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as Ms. Woodring uh, mentioned earlier in her report, uh, there are several po policies on the uh, uh, in, in before the board for first reading this evening, a uh, total of nine. And a lot of them came out of a, as a result of our review of the handbooks, and Ms. Woodring uh, helped uh, w uh, w work with the building level principals and some other home and school uh, volunteers to help us through that process. Uh, but for, th for your approval this evening on 12.2, the second reading, we have the child abuse policy, and we have policy 916, which uh, you need to be aware that uh, has changed from its first reading to its second reading, which includes the language to put back the uh, the language that was originally stricken regarding ensuring volunteers. So that is a recommendation uh, that you approve both policies 806 and 916 as presented uh, by the board. Um, and in addition to that, uh, maybe just to parlay on, on one of the questions uh, from the public r related to that matter, um, you know, there is, there is a rather extensive uh, process of review. Um, it just so happened that um, the school, and, and, and you know, certainly no excuse, but but the school visitor or volunteer policy was a was part of a a, a long, long list of policies that went before our, our solicitor to specifically review for matters of child abuse and, and issues that uh, pertain to new law changes. I believe it was Act 153, or one fifty three, one one eighty. You know the number? Yeah. Okay. A number that. I think you're uh, right. I think it is 153. Yeah, 153. And it went into effect. Yes. In December. Right. So at the end of the day, um, what 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 you know certainly there was a review process. We had much discussion about this item, um, even though it was stricken because it wasn't a matter of uh, being required by law, but because of the process, it worked to allow us to be here this evening because we had public input. We had uh, review by the board and the superintendent, and we were able to uh, bring a, a policy, hopefully for your approval this evening, that helps us all out. So, um, so, so I, I ask for your approval on both of those policies. Okay. So again, uh, the, pol the nine policies in 12.1 are for first read only, so no action on those. Um, item 12.2, policy 806 and 916. Anyone want to take any of them separately? Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to approve policy 806 and 916 as presented? Mr. Pelicano, is there a second? Ms. Woodring, any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? 8 to 0. Great. Okay, uh, moving on to other, Dr. Zerby. Under other 13.1, we have a list of four gifts and donations. Uh, we have a gift of about $500 uh, for the backpack program at Audubon Elementary School from the Montgomery County Foundation Incorporated. We have $500 from Eric and Elizabeth Hildebrand uh, for the backpack program at Skyview Upper Elementary Program. Uh, we have a gift of $480 and a food donation of $150 from AIM High Studios for the backpack program at Eagleville. This backpack program has really taken off, and I know uh, you know it all started with uh, Jen Brooker at Eagleville, and um, you know we can't say enough about that. We actually wanted to bring her in front of the board to uh, recognize her, uh, but uh, you know her feelings are simply that um, she would rather recognize the children in the effort of, of her staff, and, and I just want you to be aware of that and the public to be aware of that. But we also have other principals uh, taking her lead, Mr. Harney working with them as well. Uh, to really uh, spread this program throughout the district. So I thank all of our administrators and teachers. And, and obviously, it wouldn't happen without the donations. Uh, item number four, a gift of $30,000 from the estate of uh, Leslie uh, Rolls uh, and Greg Rolls uh, Memorial Fund uh, for the a senior athlete at Meth Acton High School. Um, so we'll be establishing a scholarship fund under that particular donation. 
Um, so that's those are the items 13.1 under 13.2, the Electric Car Club, approve a trip, Methacton High School Car Club to Penn State University, no cost uh, other than substitutes. And under 13.3, main exchange program, I've approved a trip for the main exchange program, students at Arcola Intermediate School to Hershey Park, uh, cost of district substitutes. And again, neither of these uh, trips are under, uh, are not an educational trip, and therefore that's why they're under other, and they don't fall under the policy for educational field trips. So I ask for your uh, approval of items under 13.1, 13.2, and 13.3. Anyone want to take any of these separately? Mr. Phillips? No, no. I'm, I'm good to all three. Are you making a motion? Yeah. All right. Do you want to take one separately? Okay. Which one? 13.3. Okay. So then I'll ask for a motion to approve 13.1, uh, the, accepting the gifts and donations, and 13.2, approval of the trip for the Electric Car Club. Is there a motion? Mr. Phillips, is there a second? Mr. Roth, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Eight to zero. Item 13.3, uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve a trip for the main exchange program students at Arcola to Hershey Park on May 1st. Is there a motion? Mr. Phillips, is there a second? Mr. Pelicano, discussion? Uh, just for full disclosure, my daughter is attending this trip, so I just, Mr. Andrews, just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I must say that um, it's, it's important that you also recognize that the date of when the trip is. So for us to uh, vote this particular item down this evening might uh, cause substantial hardship for uh, the students from Maine coming to Arcola. I just want to make, bring that to your attention. Any other uh, discussion or, or disclosures? Okay, seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Are you Opposed? Abstention? Okay, eight to zero. Approved. Okay, items, uh, I'm sorry, dates for board member calendars. May 4th is the Education Committee meeting. May 5th is Communications. 11th is Property. 13th is Policy. And then we'll be back here again on May 26th for our May board meeting. Item number 15, any old business? Okay, item 16, any new business? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to courtesy of the floor, and I'll give Mrs. Reese uh, the first crack at it since I knocked her out of uh, the last go around. My fault. No, 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 no. We're good like that. We'll make it quick. Um, so, just back to the SAP issue. So, I did some digging, and apparently. Andrea, can you for oh, the record. For the record, sorry. Andrea Reese, Lower Providence. Back to the SAP issue. I, so I did some digging, and apparently there is something very, very similar to SAP at the 5-6. I think I was in a panic because it's such an important program. So I just wanted to reiterate again your notes for the committee meeting and my email that whatever we can do, whether PDE recommends that, whatever it is that we, that the district can do to make sure that that program, whatever it's called, not only exists but continues to strengthen. As we all know, um, the mental health and all the other issues that SAP deals with is crucial. And as an educator, I've seen it save, I've seen it save lives. Um, and with suicide being something that needs to be brought up in schools, and it already is in Methacton, especially even at a possible younger level, I would just like to pursue that. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for the answers to the questions of last board meeting. I hadn't seen that before. Maybe it had been provided before, but there were answers. One of them was to my question and another person's question about the hiring of Jeffrey Sultanic or the use of his services. It was mentioned that there were five attorneys or five firms that you all looked into. I would, if possible, like to know who the other, my question would be who the other people were, um, because that's a very important solicitor fee and a, an important role in the district. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Reese, would you, would you mind just making sure that we, we have that question so we can get you the answer? Thank you. Okay. Courtesy of the floor. Sorry, courtesy of the floor. Mr. Bickelman? Mr. 
Joe Bickelman, Audubon. I just have a question. I don't know if I'm going to get an answer. Does the district sell its bonds competitively online? If you don't mind, when you're, when you're done with all your questions, would you put that on a card so we can get you the answer? Right. Okay. If, if, if they don't sell their bids online, I don't know if the board's familiar, but there's an online process where you can say, okay, we're offering $10 million. PFM coordinates the bid auction site. Okay. And there's a bid auction site where the banks you know, can bid from, say, 12.15 to 12.30 in the afternoon. And you can see some vigorous bidding going on, which incorporates the bond discount that the underwriter will buy the bonds. And you'll see the bidding. I think they can see the lowest bid, and they're all out to beat each other with the, the lowest interest rate, implied interest rate. So there could be a lot of savings through a tick or two in the interest rate. But board members can view that too. They can have the site and they can watch the bidding go on during the day. You know, you can look and see the competitive bid process. So I just wanted to know if, does RBC buy all the district bonds and resell them to investors? That's. If you don't mind putting that on the card, and get that, I can get that answer for you as well. Okay, I just want to, you know, the, the competitive big bid process is very good and it's usually recommended by PFM. Um, I didn't see any HR committee meeting minutes. It, the, the meeting lasted like 15 minutes, but I didn't see any minutes in the booklet up there. So. That will be correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, courtesy of the floor. Candy, are you raising your hand or are you just fanning yourself? Are you raising your hand or are you just trying to stay cool? Okay. I can't raise this arm that high. Candy, I'll um, Your calendar members, is there a finance and an HR meeting scheduled for next month? Because it's not on the cap. It's Actually, not on yeah, the agenda. May 18th. Okay. You're right. 6.30 and 7.30? Okay, yeah. just want to make that clear. Um, Let me just chime in there. The HR committee meeting will have to be rescheduled, okay, because that's my daughter's spring concert night. So we'll, we'll try String to... String Jamboree at Arcola? Uh, Skyview. But okay. we'll figure that one out. We'll... Oh, okay. It just brought to my attention, so... Okay. It's that time of the year. Um, Mr. Phillips brought up that Mr. Miller, and I, I do know that there are a number of school board members that aren't aware of our history. And I don't believe it's an issue. If there is nothing there to find, that's okay. It's worth looking into instead of maybe further down the road you get blindsided. But as someone who has been coming to these meetings for a lot of years, it's very relevant, God bless you, very relevant question items that he brought up tonight, so it needs to be looked into. Um, I was a little stunned when you brought up about the field project. And Mr. Bartle brought up that there is now parties that are entering into the appeal. Are, or, are these the same group that was involved in the continuous use hearing? Same participants? Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. As you recall, Candy, and I know you were there for, I think, almost all, all of them. Mm -hmm. okay. um, at the beginning of the hearings, we went through a process whereby people were allowed to enter their appearance and become parties. Mm -hmm. Okay. There were, my recollection is, 17 to 20 of those people who came in not only in the very beginning, but then came in throughout the process because Mr. Garrity held it open. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are now only eight of them left. Okay. Okay. That's, that's what's happening. So those, so they... Eight of them continue to be parties in the Court of Common Pleas. Okay. The others do not. Okay. So it's just, yeah, because it would sound like all of a sudden they're involved and it, to me it's like it's, you now have to write a brief, which draws it out, which costs money, because... No, all, all of that, all of that is not correct in terms of these being additional people. They are... They are the remaining people. The, re the remaining the ones that already participants. Okay, so That's they were, they've been involved all along. Because I was correct. just surprised when you brought up. Because honestly, once the decision was made, I just put the eight remaining. I figured, you know, kind of like they lost, but they didn't lose. And I mean, it's we went through the process. We had all the hearings. We spent all the money. 
the township approved the lights, but now they're saying, you can have it, but taking it away. And I mean, you had a former school director stood here in February and railed against the school board, wasting taxpayers' money on this lawsuit, and just, maybe she needs to go back to her township and say, just give us our lights. We're, we're getting the field put in. We've been gone 25, 30 years with no lights. It's time, if we're going to spend millions of dollars to put in a turf project, we need the lights. And if the people in the school district township have issues, that's their issues. Because the taxpayers are spending the money, they want their lights up there. So I, mean, I just wanted to make that clear because I was a little surprised when I thought maybe there was somebody just came in at the last minute. Nobody was adding. No one was added. Okay. Let me let me just just answer you briefly with respect to that, and and and, and I, I certainly agree. First of all, they have an opportunity in the township to make the use of lights a by right use. Mm -hmm. They chose to do it by conditional use, which makes it a litigation process. That's wasteful both with respect to the municipality and also with respect to the school district. Listen. But we don't get to call that shot. They get to determine what that ordinance says, and they did. They put that in. We had recommended against that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second issue was one whereby they approved the conditional use application. They made a lot of fanfare about we approved the conditional use application. However, in doing so, our application had a 50-foot candle, 30-foot candle illumination mm -hmm. level depending upon what sport or practice was being played. We brought the gentleman down from Penn State who testified that that was the minimum safe level necessary for play. Mm -hmm. Okay. While they granted the application, they then put a condition in that changed those levels of illumination. That means that according to our witnesses, we would have to be limited to illuminating the field to a level that was not safe. That's what I mean by we, like they said, here we, you go, but yeah, it, no. It was a little you bit know, of, it's, yeah, you're right. There's a little bit of a sleight of hand there with, with respect to the way they mm -hmm. did that. Um, that's the major problem. There are other things, there are other things that they put in as conditions to which they have no right, and I'm sure that we'll get to those through the process, but the main reason is the safety of the kids uh, mm -hmm. and, and the idea that we have to be in a matter of litigation with the township at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Courtesy, anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Good evening. Paul Winters, Little Providence. Just two quick questions. One's from my wife who had to go away. There's a change in the clearance requirements, is my understanding, that you have to do it every three years. And the communication of that to the community as those volunteers, I'm not sure has been communicated from that perspective. So that was the question from my, from my wife. The second thing, I just wanted to make a comment, and I saw Greg at the prom night, and the, the dedication of those volunteers was outstanding, and it's unbelievable. And anybody who's not participating in one of those events really needs to see how good of a school district we have. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Winters, if, if, if you would, just, just uh, Mr. Harney, who oversees HR, should be able to respond to you on that. On, on the volunteer question. clearances? Yes. That law doesn't kick in actually until July 1st, but we're ahead of the game because a lot of our volunteers have them. We're working, we have a meeting next week to work on a communication to go out to the volunteers who's are now going, who will now reach that three-year window or have expired on a three-year window to get them to do it. And then we're going to try to set up an anniversary date for all the other volunteers so they know when their three-year window will be coming up. So there will be a communication coming out within the next several weeks. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Chris Boardman, we're Suster. Uh, before I got get into what I wanted to talk about, um, I didn't know if everybody knew, but um, the honorary chair of the uh, whole uh, campaign to raise money passed away this morning, uh, Mr. Larry Smith. Is that uh, confirmed? Yeah. His daughter told us. He's, he's been ill for quite some time. So, you know, he's a great, great person, great help to the community. He lived around the corner from us in Worcester, so he's going to be missed by a lot. Um, in fact, um, he was one of the first, he was the first person in the United States to have a YMCA named after him. So, I think that speaks to the type of person he was, so that's some sad news. Um, related to the whole sporting project, um, you know, 
when we've been hearing the uh, board talk about being in a financial crisis um, with the upcoming budgets and you know publicly you've been talking about the challenges of that I wanted to try to get involved with it and uh, try to help out and one of the areas I've seen us spend a lot of money on over the last few years is the legal fees related to the whole lighting project and everything so I know that the uh, conditional use came out and you're appealing that so I wanted to do a little research and try to get on board with you know trying to promote awareness of the whole issue and and bring that to light so I did uh, I went and reviewed all the information out there on the, the lighting and everything. And I started with your, your two um, expert witnesses you brought up, Mr. Zoller and Mr. Good, and went and looked at the, uh, the companies they work for. And um, as you folks are aware of, uh, Mr. Zoller, your one expert witness, is working for uh, Musco, the, uh, the lighting consultant company that you know, you're, you're planning on using. Um, and if you look at their guidelines and you compare that to the conditional use of the two fields, the conditional use falls within the guidelines of MUSCO. And, you know, at first I thought that perhaps that's just general guidelines that they were putting out there on the web. So I looked at um, different proposals they put out for different uh, high school systems. And again, all the proposals that I came across that they put out fall within the lighting guidelines of the conditional use that Worcester came through in terms of safety. And everything that was said tonight and everything that's been talked about previously is about the player's safety and the lighting. So, um, you know, I continued looking into this and all the different high school associations I came across all follow the same guidelines of what is safe lighting. And they're all averaging about 70 foot tall towers and 30 uh, foot candles for the sporting events that are on the fields, for those fields. And I agree that your expert witness, Mr. Good, did say that um, you need 50 foot candles for sports, but not all sports, he said some sports. And those sports are clearly laid out in all these guidelines. They're baseball, softball, and tennis. And the reason being is that you have a small ball traveling at over 100 miles an hour, sometimes very close to players. So they want the 50 foot candles for those. But those sports aren't being played on any of these fields at all. And if you look at the different agencies or associations out there, they all are adhering to the same guidelines. And this uh, United Soccer Foundation is just one, but if you look at uh, lacrosse, football, field hockey, they're all adhering to the same guidelines. And um, then I went to the governing body. Mr. Borman, we're over 30 minutes, three minutes, so if you okay. can get to the question. So all, everybody out there is saying that what you need in terms of player safety is met by the conditional use and actually is exceeding because you don't need the 50 foot candles for those sports that are playing on the field that you have the 50 foot candles. So I'm quite confused as to why you're calling out player safety as the real reason for your appeal when everybody out there, including the company that you're gonna to use to put the lights in, is saying that you only need the 30 foot candles and you need an average of about 70 feet for towers. So my question is, where are you coming up with the, the safety issues related well, to the sports that are going to be played on those fields? For, first of all, um, I disagree with the, um, the uh, comments that you've made and who it is out there that suggests what level. One thing that was very clear is that uh, uh, lacrosse is to be played on both of these fields. And the testimony of Mr. Good and uh, also, Mr. Zoller was unequivocal that 50 foot candles was necessary for the safe play of lacrosse, uh, both at the practice level and also at the game level. And that's right in the, that's right in the testimony. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I would disagree that we're not playing sports that they testified to with, with regard to what those safe levels are. Uh, you have... Uh, uh, taken some of the documents, and I recognize some of those documents because uh, uh, there was an attempt to cross-examine in the hearings with regard to some of those documents. And uh, some of those documents with respect to the, uh, uh, the other states uh, were not admitted initially into the record because there was no authentication of the document, number one, and number two, they weren't the complete document. 
Uh, the township then, at the end of the hearings, incorporated those into the record, which we think is improper in the way that they that they handled that. So we'll deal with that in the court of common pleas when the uh, when the uh, time comes with that. Uh, we hired uh, two experts in this regard. Uh, the, uh, there was some issue made by the neighbors with respect to Mr. Zoller being a, an employee of Musco, and he went through in his testimony on two different occasions and answered all the questions that you've raised this evening. Uh, we had him uh, answer those questions before the board. Uh, with respect to uh, Mr. The, m with respect to Mr. Zoller, they questioned the fact that he worked for Musco and was making uh, uh, that suggestion. And so we then brought in Mr. Good, who has no affiliation with Musco or any of the other providers. Right. And and his testimony as a uh, uh, a teacher at Penn State, and teaching the course and, and working in the private practice as well, uh, was and I believe the the words that he used, and I'll paraphrase, uh, were that if they couldn't play at the 50, 30 levels that were suggested in the application, he would not allow his children to play those sports uh, in uh, in the school district in which they lived. So when when someone that comes in who is a clear expert in the field uh, gives you that type of testimony, uh, that that's compelling stuff. Then why does that conflict with proposals they're putting out to other school districts where they're building the exact same type of fields for the same sports and they're only putting out 70 or 70 foot towers with 30 foot candles on to pra both practice and play games for those sports? Okay, actually, when you get into the height of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, pole, uh, I'm, I'm interested to use that. Number one, uh, the conditional use decision does not restrict the height of the pole to 70 feet. No, anything up well, to 85 feet. Let, let me, right? let, let, let me, fit. no, 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 no. What you're talking about is the, uh, the ordinance itself. I'm talking about the conditional use decision. In the conditional use decision, the township gave us the height of the pole that we had asked for with, with, regard, okay. to the, with regard to the application. That's not one of the appealed conditions. There is no, there is no condition that limits the height of the pole. It's the, it's the testimony that we placed into the record, and that is then recited in the conditional use decision, and they adopted what we had suggested with respect to the height, and they rejected the opinion of, of Mr. Lemons, who was the the, uh, the protestant's witness. So the height of the poles are really not an issue. But since you've mentioned it, not only did our experts indicate that we needed the height that we had suggested, but also the expert that was hired by the township suggested that we needed that pole height. And the issue there is not only the fact uh, that there is an illumination level spread on the field, but that it be spread on the field uniformly. And there was, there was a great amount of testimony throughout the hearings with respect to that as well. Uh, rather than just, and I, I don't know what level of research you've done, but rather than just rely upon the conditional use decision and the, uh, uh, and, and the, uh, the ordinance itself, you might want to take a look at the uh, notes of testimony that, mm -hmm. uh, and I know it's a tough job. I mean, I was I was at all the hearings, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's and there's there's a there's a lot of notes of testimony, but all of those things that you've mentioned are covered in those notes of testimony in some detail. Okay. So, so if you have further questions, just submit them to Angela, and we'll get answered. I will. But basically, to summarize, you just confirmed that with the current lighting between the two fields, you can safely play any sport. Um, no. You can't play no. lacrosse on the second field, but you can play it on the first field because it has the 50-foot candles, right? Well, no. You, first of all, you need 50-foot you need candles for lacrosse games and also practice. Which you have. No, no, we don't. We asked, we asked for that application with respect to both fields. You have it on the one field though, right? We, we can play at 50 foot candles on only one of the two fields. Well, that was the point I just made. You have enough light on one of the fields to play the sport. If, if you want to have one game that's being played, yes. Yeah. And, and if, if that fits within your schedule. If there's something else being played on that field, then you can't play lacrosse. 
it, cre okay. it, cre it creates a lot of scheduling scheduling problems for but, the district. And by the way, that, that also is not the test in the ordinance. Yeah. But the point is that the we're in a... The test in the ordinance is, is not that you yeah. can play safely on one field, but not on the other field. The point is we're in a budget crisis and we're spending excessive legal fees to try to get that 50-foot candles on a second field when all we have to do is accept that and we still have a field for the lacrosse team to play on. That, that, that's not so. Okay. That's not so. If you, if you have a question, if you have other questions, we have a card there you can certainly fill out. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Other courtesy of the floor? Preston Lutweiler again, Lower Providence. Um, at the hearing on the uh, potential closing of Audubon and uh, or Arrowhead School, um, I had submitted a list of questions because I saw that we were asked to submit them in writing to get answers and I had my email address and phone number on there and I have not e received a response specifically to this list of questions and I have looked at the questions and the answers that have been posted on the website and there are some answers to some of them, kind of, um, but I just thought that I would submit them again this evening and not go through them again, but just ask you to try to formulate an answer or pass them on to the committees that are charged with formulating the answers to these questions so that they can be included in the work that they're doing. That's point number one. Yeah, and we, we will do that. Uh, again, we had, we had a significant number of, uh, of, of, res of responses from the public relative to questions about the Pell study. Uh, yours may have been part of that group. At the end of the day, it's our goal to provide those to the committee, and we have done that. Um, whether or not that it makes the final mustard in the committee's uh, final list of questions, um, I can't tell you that until they have a final list by May 1st. But if you would like to submit them as uh, to, to Angela, we can certainly uh, get you answers and post them on the website. Okay, I'll do that. And that, that's my first point. And the second point is, um, I have been at Lower Providence Township meetings where there were discussions about an LED sign and an ordinance that would allow an LED sign to be put up at Arcola. And I saw something that I very rarely see there. Unanimously, the Planning Commission voted it down. And when it got to the township supervisors, it died because nobody would make a motion to support it. So you've managed to um, make for a strained relationship with the Lower Providence Township supervisors. I'm amazed to hear this evening that Worcester Township is working with you cooperatively to try to expedite your project for the field project. While you have them in court on this issue of the lighting and they are spending money and you are spending money on the lighting. And I'm just asking all of the school board members here this evening to look in their heart and decide whether any of them have the decency and the courage to pass a motion or propose a motion to resolve the litigation issues with the townships you serve, Lower Province and Worcester, without spending more legal money. Thank you. Uh, Christian? Can I, can I put... Okay, I, I, think, I think there might be some confusion. I think at, at the last board meeting, and, and please stay at the mic in case you, you have a response. I think at the last board meeting, there was a member of the public that uh, made reference to the fact that uh, the Methacton School District somehow or another might be involved with a, uh, a, an ordinance uh, that's before the Lower Providence uh, Township uh, Board of Supervisors or Planning Commission regarding an overlay that apparently, um, as you mentioned, did not ha or had a unanimous, unanimous unanimous uh, vote to t uh, turn that particular thing down and then also uh, failed to pass for the for no motion by the supervisors. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is the Methacton School District does not have a matter before or a party to the, a matter before Lower Providence Township. And so, it, although there's speculation that uh, we have a, a matter before the township either currently 
or formerly as a, as a result of a lawsuit uh, per, pertaining to an issue or a similar issue regarding the former uh, superintendent of schools, um, we're not aware of any of those matters. Um, would we be, would would we potentially benefit if uh, an ordinance such uh, that was being presented to uh, the planning commission? Uh, we we may, and so at the at the end of the day, um, the, the the district does not have a particular uh, is not a particular party to this to this matter before the township. If, however, the way it's, it's worded and the, the ordinance or the overlay is, is worded, all government entities, including school districts and, and maybe some other parties, could, could actually benefit from the matter. So the district could benefit at the end of the day if it is passed. So I just want to be clear on, on you know, our involvement in that or our not involvement in that because there was an assumption that at the last meeting, and, and, and I'm, I'm not certain if you're making that same assumption, so I just wanted to clear that up. I'm, I'm not. Okay. And it's very clear in my mind um, that that overlay ordinance was totally unrelated to everything that was going on with the school district except for coincidental timing. And it was unfortunate because there were many people True. who were drawing connections between the dots has, has and, been, yeah. and attributing motives that were, that I am convinced were never there. So I, you know, I, I understand that those were separate issues, but it just happened to be at the same time that this issue came up about the LED lighting board at um, Arcola. And um, it, it was not well received. And I, and I heard many people testify, including Candy, um, uh, you know, just questioning why this was such, seemed to be such a compelling need. Because it was very clear from the ta township solicitor that the ordinance really was drafted based on the requirements that had been presented by the solicitor or somebody from the school board for that sign board. I'm sorry, you're saying that that was, that was stated in the meeting? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, well, well, we'll look into that matter and uh, I'll be able to report back to the board. Yeah, because as, as I understand it, the decision by the zoning hearing board to deny the original application, which happened in 2010, I believe, is still pending. So the clock is still running for the attorneys. Thank you. No, I, I, I think, sir, really, there, there are two different issues. That, that matter that was filed in 2010 was appealed to the Court of Common Pleas. I don't believe that there was anything ever done to that uh, to end that matter, but that is not an ongoing matter of litigation. We're not, uh, we're not filing anything or doing anything with respect to that matter. That, and that matter predates us anyway. If I could just add one small comment to all that. I was at the same meeting. The paperwork that was presented identified the Methacton School District as the petitioner. Uh, I inquired with uh, council and, and also with the supervisors as to whether or not where that originated. Uh, none of them could tell me, and they're looking into where that came from because it did not come from Methacton, even though we were named on the paperwork. That was brought to the planning commission. I will also say, as Lower Providence liaison, we do have a very good relationship with the supervisors there. Okay. All, all I can say is there, there's uh, under since I've been here, we have not had an application before the township uh, board of supervisors. Um, so if there is one there, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the supervisors and see you know, where they're at in the process. Uh, my, my point uh, was that. the application that has been referred to is an application that was filed several years ago. As the gentleman who just spoke said, it was, it's a 2010 matter. That uh, denial before the board was appealed to the Court of Common Pleas of Montgomery County, and that's where it sits. So um, I guess we could do something to terminate the the appeal but there is no action on the appeal or no legal fees being charged to the district as a result of that now if there were plans or specifications that were provided at that time to lower providence township in connection with whatever was filed before the zoning hearing board those 
those plans and applications may still exist out there and someone may be referencing them or using them in hearings. That's, that's all that, that I, I could suggest. I know my, my partner in the office, Eric Fry, was involved in that matter uh, subsequent to the denial by, uh, uh, by the, uh, the Zoning Hearing Board of the application that was essentially presented, I believe, by the former superintendent. Is that, is that one of those? Is, that's what the, the date was? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get back yeah. to courtesy of the floor. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Ashley Wilkerson from Audubon. Um, I want to start by saying thank you for posting the answers to the questions from the last board meeting because that was really helpful. And I just have a few follow-up questions uh, from the answers on the website. I was the one who had asked with the budget crisis that's confronting us, what is plan B? Uh, with the assumption that plan A is that we close an elementary school and presumably see some sort of financial benefit from that. And the response talks about how the finance committee is tasked with these sorts of things and talks about contract negotiations, monitoring and negotiation of vendor agreements those sorts of things but it doesn't sound like the sort of plan that I would expect that is on par with closing a school so my question is still what is plan B and the follow-up to that is where there'll be another committee to address this first because with the consolidation committee the enrollment capacity and education committee was initially when it was first presented to us tasked with looking at alternative solutions and it looks like that language was removed when the applications were posted on the board's website uh, will that language be added back in will we look for alternatives or will we establish an entirely new committee to look at alternatives I don't believe that's an unreasonable request because when you look at the formation of the consolidation committee we have a committee that is tasked with redistricting just in case we need to do that we have a committee that is tasked with staff and student um, helping them relocate to their new schools and transition just in case we need to do that we don't have anybody who's looking at what do we do just in case we can't close a school and that's really important if in fact the committee is not tasked with just closing the school if we are truly looking at whether or not to close it and we're looking at what we're going to do if it closes we also need to look at what we're going to do if it doesn't close uh, my second question um, we with these committees are supposed to be looking at an RFP for redistricting. I'm curious why an RFP was never done for Pell in the first place, uh, since that's what started this whole ball rolling. My understanding from someone else who did a right to know request is that there was no RFP for Pell, that they were just hired without considering any other firms. So will the Enrollment Capacity Committee be looking at RFPs for other companies to do a data analysis, since we have so many questions about the data from Pell? Third question, um, with the consolidation vote, I asked which board would be voting on that because not everyone on the board is running for re-election, so it means that after the elections in November, there will be a, there's a 100% likelihood that the board members who are here now won't be the same board members who are here this time next year. December 1st is the last board meeting for the current board. December 7th is the first board meeting for the newly elected board members. But the answer to the question as to when the vote on whether or not to consolidate schools is going to occur is by the board members who are here in December. That's not a direct answer and I'm looking for a time frame. Are we trying to get all of this done by the first day of December so that everything can be voted on or are we trying to get this done just so that sometime in December at the earliest it can be voted on because that's not clear on the answer on the website. Mr. Wilkerson, if those are those are good questions and we appreciate, we appreciate the questions. If you wouldn't mind if we could get them in writing and get them up on the on the website. You actually have that in writing because I sent an email to every member of the board and you uh, and never received an answer. W would you mind then sending it to, to absolutely as a result thank you and the, the last item I'd like to mention is with regard to again these consolidation committees and this is uh, another email that I'd sent to everyone and didn't get a response to you your last point for a second? yes you, you, uh, you had a question as to two alternatives and you asked whether the the date in December was to allow this board to complete a process by then or whether it was the earliest date at which the a vote I'm asking what the intent is is the intent that this board will vote or is it the intent that the next board will vote uh, it really doesn't matter because if this board votes on that issue it could be rescinded by the next board and you're only talking about what five days between or six days between, okay. the, two, between the two meetings so there there is there is nothing with the, the way that the board has configured this 
there is nothing that this board can do to bind the school district to be in, in the position that you're referring to. Okay. And then my final comment is just regarding another email that I didn't get any response to looking at the composition of the Consolidation Committee, uh, particularly the Enrollment and Capacity and Education Committee, uh, because that's one that directly impacts Audubon Elementary, where my daughter is in school right now. And I don't have any problem at all that there is a parent on that committee who sends their child to private school. I think that parent should be there because they're a taxpayer. Don't have any problem at all that there is someone on that committee who has been voicing that Audubon should close because that voice deserves to be heard. My question is, if this committee is truly supposed to represent all of us in the community, community where is Audubon represented? We've got no one from our school on that committee. And I don't see how you allow that to happen if you're truly trying to include the entire community who is going to be impacted by these decisions. I'm not saying that we are the only voice that needs to be heard by any means, but I am really concerned that the only Audubon representatives on the entire committee are on the redistricting and the staff and student transition as if we are just going ahead and planning on closing down the school. And I'm not saying the school doesn't need to close. Maybe it does. but. As I said in the email and as I said to several of you who I met with at a committee meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, it just looks bad when it looks like the committees are stacked against our school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional items for courtesy of floor? Hi everyone, Michelle Kirshner, Audubon. Um, I do echo all of Ashley's thoughts from tonight, especially her idea to have that alternative ideas committee. What better people to have on it than Audubon families? So I would volunteer myself. I'm sure Ashley would volunteer, um, but I do hope you div do give that idea some consideration. Um, I appreciate that you guys have tabled the RBC to sit vote to um, you know, give it your due diligence to really make the right decision. It does show that you do care about our school. Um, I understand that some of the, the finance committee or one of the committees is going to be putting together a list of questions that they need answers from Pell. However, there's probably like 200 other questions that myself and many other parents are waiting for answers from. Is it up to the other committees to answer the questions that they asked or is that up to the school board to start giving us some answers for all of those questions? I think with re regards to your uh, question about the, co the enrollment committee, um, they have taken all the questions that were presented at both of the hearings. They've also taken all the questions that were emailed or submitted in writing uh, to the Methacton School District and pr 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 provided that to the enrollment education and uh, uh, consolidation committee. So they are currently reviewing that. They are then going to come back and, and present a written document to respond to those questions as well as present those responses to the entire consolidation so committee they're which includes answer their own questions because a lot of the people on those committees ask those questions well again some of those individuals asked questions some did not um, we we have you know the people on the on the uh, enrollment committee some asked questions and some did not at the end of the day the Pell will come back and give answers in a presentation and in writing to all 25, it's, well, I think it's 26 members total now, of, of the entire consolidation committee. So those folks that are uh, specifically interested in, in finance, those that were specifically interested in uh, student and staff transition, those that are interested in the redrawing, sort of members of those committees along with the individuals on the uh, Enrollment Committee will hear the responses. And then as I presented uh, earlier, that information will then be represented in a public meeting before the board and members of, of the public so that those responses can be, get out. If there's any additional follow-up questions, you know, we will address them as necessary. But I mean, they're, they're certainly, you need to know that there was a volume of questions, not only from the hearings, but through email and right. that that group is diligently working through the process to put those in a, in a fashion that can be, can be uh, responded to quickly. I, I hope it's as diligently as you say it is because I feel like I know more about the fields and lightings than I do about all of the questions that I, and that I need information on about the school and what's happening, <clears throat> excuse me, with everything. 
I, I, and I appreciate your comment. And uh, we, we, what we're trying to do is we, we provided uh, notes uh, on the on the minutes from the meetings, and uh, we are continue to do that as we as we progress through the process. Okay. Um, but it, it has taken us some time to, you know, put the applications out, have people apply, select the uh, uh, volunteers, and get the ball rolling. So we've started that on April 22nd, and we continue to move that as quickly as we can, but purposely so that we can get the work done and correctly. Um, so lastly, um, you know, I heard it at the hearings. You know, the school board, we've been, parents have invited you to come into all the elementary schools to really get a good understanding of, you know, what happens in the classroom, what does it look like with 22 kids in a classroom in elementary grades, what's needed in the classroom and all that. Can you just by a show of hands, if you have been in any of the classrooms since the February 23rd hearing? You know what, I, I will make a comment on that. I Thank have you. been in these classrooms volunteering for the past 12 years. So I have been in them probably a lot longer than most of you have been in the classrooms. So when I do take offense that you, you do say that we don't do this. We go there when, when appropriate. And I will echo those comments too. I have two children in the district. I've volunteered numerous times. I've sat in on, um, name escapes me, I'm sorry, it's getting late, on the readathon days at Worcester Elementary with all those kids many times. I've done that. So I am aware perfectly of how many kids are in those classrooms in elementary schools. So um, for you to charge that, say I haven't been there and done that, that's not fair. Because well, we I was have just kids asking those, who has been there. Those, yeah. those classrooms and we have a vested interest the, in this district as the well. Board, the board Good. multiple times a year does tours of, of the schools, so we've Thank all been you. in the classrooms. Thank you. Thanks. Additional courtesy of the floor? Michael Ryan, Audubon. Uh, first, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you. Uh, a step in the right direction, I think, with the communication process. Um, it was nice to see the list of all the questions that were out there, and a majority of them answered on the website. Um, it's nice to not hear from what Mr. Mr. Bickelman said before, the sounds of silence when we talk to you. There's actually some interaction tonight responding to questions. I think this is a great step in repairing some of the relations. Um, I do have a, a suggestion. We have a committee that's called Communications and Community Relations. But a lot of times it seems like it's just marketing. You know, here's our newsletter, how many people read it, how many more people are going to read it next month. Um, we talk about putting the board meetings on TV, how many people watched it. Um, communications is a two-way street. There should be some type of avenue, as opposed to a simple three minutes that you get cut off with at the end, for residents to truly voice a concern over a particular issue. Uh, my idea would be, why not create, under the communications committee, a community advocacy group that consists of just residents, um, where if people have problems, they can come to this group, they can funnel the ideas, prioritize, and report directly to the communications committee. Um, it would seem like a nice way to, for people to feel heard and for you to not get bombarded with questions about anything at a board meeting and you'd actually have a chance to look it over, respond, and have a real dialogue back and forth. Um, my other thing has to do with, and I hoped I'd never come up here and have to say Pell again, but tonight there was a list of bills approved and there is yet another payment to Pell. I was curious if anybody on the board noticed that payment in there, because we all you know, voted it through, for $11,000. So we paid them $9,000 to start, twenty-one dollars to finish, and then this payment is $11,000 for additional services. I'm assuming that it was the additional um, hearings and public presentations that they had to do, and to respond to questions. What type of service allows you to present something, but is going to charge you for questions regarding that? I have no idea who would do that. The worst part about this is, we now have an enrollment and capacity committee who is designing more questions to go to Pell. We talked for the longest time that there are so many residents who have statistical knowledge, um, mathematical knowledge. There's these resources in the community. And once again, we haven't looked at any of this. We put a couple of people on the committee 
who were just in charge of truly directing questions to Pell. Guess what? Pell is not going to change what they said. They're going to stick by it. They're not going to change their assumptions, and you're going to get the same answer back. To spend more money to get the same exact answer is insanity. Thank you. John, I think you had your hand up. Did you have your hand up? Yes. Come on. Uh, John Andrews, Lower Providence. With regard to the uh, Consolidation Committee, uh, uh, one of the subcommittees is in trying to get clarification on the Pell report. And uh, <clears throat> I think one thing that the Pell report is glaringly absent on for our situation it is that it's a low confidence set of numbers and and I think that to the extent that we have a low confidence set of numbers uh, <clears throat> we do need the alternatives part of the original committee to look at at the options that Mr. Thompson presented and the options that others, including myself, have presented. And the options can be evaluated uh, on the basis of a set of numerical criteria, uh, and, and that can be done fairly easily. But the, uh, you know, with, the, with what happened with Skyview, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, the, the community was not satisfied as to the need for Skyview, and now we're paying for it big time. Some of those bonds are at five and three quarter percent. Uh, so I think uh, for good community relations, we need to end up with a set of enrollment projections that the community uh, uh, can accept. On a separate issue, uh, Mr. Nascimento back in December said we're going to do things differently in 2015. We're going to have one meeting a month of the board and lots of committee meetings. He didn't say what time they'd be at. Uh, but I, I think overall the committee meetings is too many of them early in the morning. I don't see other school districts doing that. With regard to the one meeting a month, with the, uh, regard to other school districts, they put out things called uh, pre preliminary agendas and, and final agendas. The preliminary agenda might be at least a week ahead of the meeting. The, the final agenda would be at least three days ahead of the meeting. Uh, it, you, last year, uh, we had a list of bills at the workshop meeting, which preceded the, the voting meeting by a week. This year, we have 24 hours between the list of bills and and when the when the meeting starts, uh, the, whether or not that's adequate, in my view, it's a serious lack of transparency and and I, I think also uh, <clears throat> the setup this year that Mr. Nascimento instituted, I think it you know it allows him to to meet. Uh, once a month uh, uh, on whatever issues we have, although there are, spe there are executive sessions uh, uh, that have happened already this year, but I, I think that uh, the community has some uh, capable people in it and, and we're all better off uh, when, when uh, when we have a lot of people working the issues, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we 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 do have a lot of serious issues that go along with a hundred million dollar budget and the education of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Additional courtesy of the floor. Okay, seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Pelicano, is there a second? Ms. Hackett, all those in favor? Thank you.
Good. I, I, one, one thing I'd like to clear, clear up about the cost for legal expenses uh, on the lights. Many of us weren't here five years ago, six years ago, and back then, Eric Fry donated his services to us. He's a land use attorney. And he wrote the ordinance because the township said we had to ask for, they didn't know whether we wanted lights or not. And they said we had to ask. We asked, they said we had to write the ordinance for them. Eric Fry donated his time, wrote the ordinance the way we needed it to be spec'd out so we can have lights by right. So the only thing we had to do is fill out a permit and put the lights up. Okay, the township said, well, you know, we don't like the way you wrote the ordinance. The township then changed everything in the ordinance, made it a conditional use. The township created this situation where the attorneys are working like mad and the taxpayers are spending money like crazy. When we first started down this project six years ago, I told the board, I said, this is going to be a five-year project to get everything approved and started. And they said, ah, no way. You know what? That township held us up this long. The expenses got higher. The cost of doing business got higher. And they create this situation that the attorneys are making all this money. It's not the school board. We did our job, and we found someone to do their work pro bono so we could just apply for the lights. The township created this. So it's not the board's fault about these expenses. Any other? I'm just going to go on the discussion and the motion to the executive adjourn. All those in favor? Opposed? Any other? Thank you.